Hey. Hello. Hi. Um, look, look, I know how the internet works, and I know that people prefer to watch videos about things they're familiar with. You almost certainly have never heard of what I'm about to talk to you about, but I'm just begging you to sit here and listen to me describe to you the most insane YA books maybe ever made. And I know that that's a crazy tier because I personally cover a bunch of very wild YA books and non-YA books. But in this circumstance, I'm just, please. <laughs> I have found a trilogy unlike any other. This is the kind of bad book, like, that bad book lovers are always seeking. It's what we're always looking for. Just unchecked, ripened outrageousness and offense in a mainstream YA veneer. Like, this series came out from Simon and Schulster in 2013. And, um, never before has this happened, I kept getting the impulse to contact every single name I could find in the acknowledgement section and just, like, shake them down for answers. How did this book series get published? This is uniquely one of the most horrifyingly bad books I've ever discovered, and pretty much no one knows about it. I've had a couple people reach out to me on Tumblr with memories about it, otherwise completely obscure, it seems. And... There's so much, like, wiggle room that I'm willing to give to indie novels because I just, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room here, but this wasn't indie. This was mainstream Simon & Schulster, one of the big five publishers. So many people had to sign off on what I'm gonna tell you. Edit it, improve it, just give their approval to what this is, and that in itself is a nightmare. <laughs> And this is because The Blessed, or later renamed Precious Blood, is both floor-to-ceiling, unstopped insanity, and also profoundly harmful. Um, I'm gonna list content warnings after this introduction, and more than ever, I'm really not kidding. I do content warnings for a reason, and in this case, Precious Blood has some of the most extreme warnings I'm gonna be giving for content. And again, this is a YA mainstream book, okay? This is a trilogy about three teenage girls who torture and die after meeting a hot boy once. It's a story about three teens who murder without abandon and who are glorified for it because their foes are unnamed villains and um, legitimately homeless drug addicts. This is one of the most viscerally violent and hateful books I've ever read, and as covered by, I think, my last video in Tender as the Flesh, I am so far from sensitive to extreme graphic content. But this is just a manifesto of death for vaguely defined faith, but also it's in the style of, like, Gossip Girl. It is ludicrous and puzzling, and the author probably was paid more money at once than you ever will be for it by a big five publisher by Simon and Schulster. Like, please, if you can handle it, listen to me. My tale of woe. <laughs> Precious blood and all its absurdity. Who, who let this get made? Content warnings for this book are quite serious. There's a lot of really graphic detail that I'm going to be reading. Again, this is a book that was published for kids around the age of like 15 plus, but that doesn't mean we're going to co cover just a bunch of sensitive topics. And if you think you aren't able to handle these topics, take a moment, come back or don't come back. I'm quite serious about this. So topics that we're going to be covering, reading about, discussing in the contents of discussing these books include ableism, anti-Semitism, gore, abuse, rape attempts, assault, graphic violence, transphobic language, ableist language, child abuse, suicide, self-harm, unhealthy and abusive relationships, cults, the vilification of the homeless, um, vilification of addicts, glorification of self-harm, anti-psychiatry, anti-medication, psych ward abuse, eye gore, drug overdose, police brutality, and I've been very worried that frankly I've missed a few, but those are the main ones. Thank you. I 
I first learned about Precious Blood by accident. I was looking for something else. Somebody recommended me a book on Tumblr, You Know Who You Are. And as I was looking for the name of that book, which was also similarly called like The Blessed, I found this one. The cover drew me in and I had to look at it and I just instantly knew that this was for me. This was going to be my perfect series to read. I pretty much dropped everything and started reading them right away. 2012 was at the height of the paranormal romance boom, and this is by an author who had some early YA hit I've not heard of called Ghost Girl, which I understand was mildly successful. I think some people will know that. To a degree, Precious Blood slots into the trends of YA at the time. In every other way, though, it's just an outlier, especially as rather than like cater to paranormal romance, it instead focuses on the other side of YA at the time, which was edgy teen drama that claims to be like realistic. This was a really big subgenre, and even now, I think there's a show called Euphoria that is basically the same category. It's this genre usually about multiple teen girls especially, around high school age who all have deadly secrets. Usually things crossing into categories of violence, sex, and drugs. Uh, this is, to my understanding, basically like Gossip Girl, Pretty Little Liars, um, Skins, probably more. They're these really kind of like edgy, hardcore teen shows. And I don't know the genre well, but this is what Precious Blood specifically is based on. It's trying to emulate this very obviously. It's edginess and extremely shocking content, all under the reasoning that this is what real teens are like, and that the grit and the poor taste is just realism. I personally don't buy that at all. <laughs> that's, I don't think that that's really what real teens were up to even then. But yeah, Precious Blood by Tanya Hurley. Like, let's actually get into it. There's very little context that I can give to prepare you for what lies ahead. So <laughs> let's just go into book one, Precious Blood. The book follows three Brooklyn teens and introduces them at their worst, essentially, all having a near-death experience and in the hospital. Agnes is introduced first, and she is rushed in after a suicide attempt by her um, extremely emotionally abusive mother, um, Martha. Agnes is obsessed with love and dreams of true love and ideal the idealization of like harming yourself because of love. It, that's something that the series will never shake and that's sort of core to Agnes's character. Next is Cecilia, also called Cece. She's a school dropout punk rocker who has passed out in a gutter and nearly drowned. Cecilia is tough and semi-homeless. She's trying to chase her dreams in New York City but just not found her break yet. Lastly, we meet Lucy. Lucy has overdosed. She is a socialite party girl, also not in high school, who is constantly on gossip websites but has no real claim to fame. Rather, her friend Jessie runs a hot gossip website and keeps posting about her to just drum up more fame for her. And in exchange, she gossips back to him and provides fuel for the website. Lucy pretends to be rich, but actually spends all her money on clothes to fit in at parties. She's super rude and entitled. The writing immediately is bad, like just so bad, but particularly the dialogue. The entire series is written in these sort of sassy one-liners that don't make a lot of sense and are at odds with every situation. And in general, <laughs> they're really not funny. Um, <laughs> you're going to see a lot of that, but here's just some from really early in the book. This is uh, Cecilia being in, like, taken in at the hospital, so she's talking with a nurse. Religion? Currently, I'm practicing the ancient art of... She paused as he typed. I don't give a fuck-ism. He continued typing until the end, then pressed the delete button. I can't type that. Sure you can. No, I can't. And they say this is a free country, Cecilia said. Okay, I'm a practicing nihilist. Why don't I come back later? He pushed the computer cart out of the room as he closed the curtain. Don't be like that, she called after him apologetically. I'm just bored. Page 17. The three leads all gather at the hospital, but they don't actually meet each other at this stage. Instead, they get linked up in different ways by another key character, Sebastian. Sebastian comes to Cecilia's hospital bed to obnoxiously flirt and gives her an ancient prayer bracelet, which is called a milagro or a chaplet. It's called both over the course of the series. 
Agnes is sent to the psych ward, and a young boy there named Jude gives her a similar chaplet on behalf of Sebastian. Lucy just finds her chaplet in her bag. All three girls are instantly just taken in by these random bracelets and begin to wear them every single day. Each one of them has a specific charm dangling from it too, so Lucy has eyes, Agnes has a heart, and Cecilia has like a bowstring sword. Already this is really weird, but we just kind of have to roll with it. This is just the initial setup. They have to get these girls together somehow, and it's with special bracelets. Agnes at the psych ward meets the head of psychiatry, um, Dr. Frey. Dr. Frey is also the lead villain, but this isn't immediately obvious. This series is one of the rare ones where there's a lot of minor side characters who all actually do notable things at some point in the trilogy. So you're gonna have to bear with me about introducing like a lot of names. Um, I will try to make it clear who everybody is when they come up again. But uh, yeah, there's going to be just a lot of random character names, such as Jude, the person who gave the chaplet. He is a six-year-old boy who's in the psych ward, which is like kind of really way too young for extended stay on his own. But then his doctor is the villain. So we're going to see a lot of psych ward related just abuse going on. Agnes is then cleared to leave the ward, where her mother continues to berate her for acting so foolishly about a boy, which again was her trying to commit suicide. Her mother is the worst. At school, Agnes is an outsider, where her only friend Hazel is the only one who supports her. At the hospital, meanwhile, Lucy stops from her discharge to go legitimately harass an old schoolmate and take a photo, mocking her for having had a secret abortion. That's just one of the first things one of our main character does off the bat. And the leads are supposed to start as bad people, but this is one of the most extreme ones. <laughs> Anyways, Lucy then returns to her party lifestyle, with Jessie helping her get into parties, and she also has a friend named Tony, a bouncer who will be super important later but won't appear for a long time, so don't worry about Tony, he'll just- he'll be there eventually. Lastly, Cecilia runs a rock show. She bumps into a scummy musician and Catherine. Catherine is a fangirl of her. She then heads home to talk to Bill, her homeless friend. Again, I'm gonna try and add context when these names come up again, but in the first, very first part of this book, they're just establishing a lot of things for three different characters. It's a bit much. Now, not much actually happens until there's a huge three-day storm coming up. All the girls feel compelled and just sort of stumble to the same church the day of the storm, winding up trapped inside and having to wait it out. The church is closed for construction, and the church is called Precious Blood. This is what the series was later renamed to. The first book was originally just called The Blessed. It later gets called Precious Blood. In the church, they all meet Sebastian, either again or for the first time. Each one feels like an instant connection to him and feels that he is spe like specially talking to them in particular, leading to feelings of jealousy for the three girls. Eventually they notice the matching chaplets he gave each of them, which match the symbols in the church. Despite that, and all of the really weird circumstances, the girls aren't very demanding for answers, and there isn't really much lore going on. They just sort of they sort of roll with, I guess, what the logical assumption would be, which is that this is a weird man who is trying to pick up sick girls at the hospital with matching bracelets. But even that, they don't feel that they're- they don't feel like they're in danger from Sebastian. They don't feel that he's even that creepy because he's just hot. There's a lot of just, you really have to suspend your disbelief to believe that these girls would act like this, okay? And yeah, no, so they, they just all really trust Sebastian instantly. He's really charming, and he hints that they're all there for like a special reason, including himself, and they just trust him. Things that are just red flags, they're utterly dismissed and ignored by the leads. Like, here's the conversation they have, okay? Legitimately. Uh, these are the girls discussing it. He's sensitive with Agnes, inspiring with you, reassuring with me. He doesn't even know us, but he knows what we want, what we need. Your theories are making me tired, Cecilia yawned, standing. Besides, why do you care? I don't really, but I do, Lucy said. Don't you? Cecilia went silent as they walked towards a pew at the front of the church, sneaking peeks back at Sebastian, comforting Agnes. 
Yeah, I guess I do, she admitted. Whatever, it will be a good story someday, Lucy said. Maybe he's just a religious fanatic or a Bible banger or something. Page 98. Um, yeah, so the girls, again, trapped in a church of a strange man who stalked them individually to give them bracelets so they'd stumble here. Just dismiss him. They don't feel in any danger. They realize that he changes how he acts according to each one of them. Not threatened by this at all. The girls and Sebastian just sort of wander around the church. While he's busy somewhere else doing unclear things, they go through a locked, semi-hidden door. Inside, they find a bone crypt full of artifacts, including a bone chandelier, statues hidden under cloth, and an actual Iron Maiden. Which, if you need a reminder, Iron Maidens are not- <laughs> they're stereotypical, like, medieval torture devices full of needles. They were never actually used. They were sort of made up when people were discussing the Middle Ages to be like, oh, they use these horrifying torture. They were never really used. There's not such a thing as a real Iron Maiden. But there is here. Written across the walls repeatedly is the word cipher, just scrawled in marker. And Agnes begins immediately to fall into some sort of seizure, muttering in Latin and reading with her eyes closed. What follows is a sort of religious torture fever dream. They all begin to feel strange with auditory and visual hallucinations. Cecilia becomes dizzy and stumbles backwards inside the Iron Maiden, which closes with her inside, leading her to be pierced across her body with nails. The chamber is described as full of gore, pus, vomit, and blood as the girls all begin to just go insane with religious ecstasy, I guess? Agnes rips off all of her bandages as Cecilia flit sits on the floor bleeding especially from her palms. Lucy vomits all over the place and Agnes is just chanting in Latin the whole time. Lucy then approaches a mirror in her haze and begins to bash her head repeatedly against it, becoming impaled on glass with many shards becoming stuck in her scalp. Agnes lights herself on fire. And this is all extremely graphic and visceral. I'm only going to do a little bit of quoting from it, but the whole scene is some of the most vivid gore and torture I've read, especially in a YA novel like this. It's absolutely wild. It takes such a left turn from being an extremely boring kind of book with some weird vibes to, oh my god, what is happening? <laughs> okay, here's some, here's some quotes. <laughs> Agnes crawled towards the votive stand, gazing at the low light of the candle flame and stretched her hand out stiffly above it, like a curious child over a hot stove. She lowered it gradually, drops of Cecilia's still fresh blood dripping from her hand into the candle cup and sizzling, until it was perched near enough to the flame to hurt, her long hair near enough to ignite. As the frayed ends began to catch, the acrid smell of burning hair mixed with the rankness of the room. Through the gaze she appeared to Lucy, through the haze, I believe, she appeared to Lucy, who was now lying on a mirror bed of shards, as a pathetic wraith, damned to infinitely repeat a ritual that might one day earn forgiveness for her. Page 164. <laughs> So Lucy tries to remain sane, but Agnes is just embracing the chaos. Suddenly, the bone chandelier above begins to rain red-hot wax, which blinds and burns Lucy. Molten wax from the candelabra rained down, droplets of fire splashing Lucy's eyes, face, and hair. She was glazed, coated like a mold. She felt as if her eyelids had been glued closed and her eyes cooked into gooey marbles in their sockets. Blinded suffocating, without mercy. I... I can't see. Her instinct was to rip it away, but she didn't. Instead, she ran her trembling fingers along the cooling ridges of the textured mass, the second skin that covered her. She had the sense of molting, but in reverse, of being encased like a wick inside one of the tapers, waiting for a match to ignite her, set her aflame, consume her. Page 166. Let me look into the camera for this one. What's going on? <laughs> the girls all just pass out until Sebastian arrives for them. There's a lot of talk about, I mean, there's just, I need to stop knocking the table. There's just so much to talk about in the religious ecstasy torture scene. 
The graphicness of it, again, is one. While the writing style before had not avoided gruesome details, like just bits of shock, like with the first chapter hospital sequences being really uncomfortable, honestly, this section is so much more, and this series will continue to just have some of the most visceral depictions of torture and gore I've honestly ever read. Like, look forward to it, or fear it. It's gonna come. I do not mind most gore or violence, especially reading it doesn't really bother me, but it's shocking how much this series gets away with for the era and the age rating. It's much worse than a number of adult books I've read, like trying to write gross gore or torture. And honestly, I think a lot of the prose here is pretty well done too. Weirdly, in general, the series does have these sections of good prose to it. The dialogue and plot and characters and theme and plot are all bad, but a lot of the incidental descriptions are surprisingly good, and the violence is part of that. It's just so out of place and surprising that it doesn't work, even if I think it's written pretty well, some of the torture. Okay, it's the wrong book for it. Like, the book so far has been utterly nothing. Even when they all meet up and meet Sebastian, the mysterious catalyst, nothing. Then they stumble into a secret crypt and all go insane for a time, and bam. Okay. <laughs> they turn into saints and they essentially lose all personality and drive for the rest of the series. This is just what happens when you become a saint and how you become a saint. Sebastian finally explains his deal, which means that I can clarify the very vague states like stakes of the series. We just had to sit through the torture first. So Sebastian says this underground chapel was made by Italian immigrants with their bare hands to worship three female saints, Lucy, Cecilia, and Agnes. They belong to a cult of Catholic saint worship, um, and specifically this cult and their worship to it became known as like the Subway Saints or the Saints of um, Plunkett Street or whatever. Not that important. And um, when I said that we get answers, I mildly lied. There are very few answers in this series, and it really ends there at this point. Sebastian takes a long time to outline the plot, so I'll do it now, but it's, it's going to be disappointing how much he actually gives you for answers. Sebastian escaped from Dr. Frey's psych ward recently to hide in the Precious Blood Church. He stole the three chaplets from there to give to the girls. He believes that he is Saint Sebastian and will soon be martyred, and that the girls are three other saints similarly reborn to perform miracles. Or maybe not reborn, but just are, because rather famously, Christianity, Catholicism doesn't belong in- it doesn't believe in reincarnation, so it's a little bit vague if he is Saint Sebastian reborn, if he is being possessed by Saint Sebastian from heaven, unknown. It, it just is there. Like, there's no explanation of what to do exactly or why this has happened, nor who the bad guys are. Like, that cipher that was written on the wall, the word cipher. We later learn cipher is the name of a secret group of powerful people who control the world to lead people towards sin through mainstream culture. <laughs> And if that sounds a little bit like blood libel, you're right, but we'll get there. Cypher maybe are immortal demons, but it's never expanded upon, and we primarily only see Dr. Frey. We meet, like, one other Cypher guy majorly later in the series. The villains pretty much have no clear goal or, um, I mean, we don't even know what the villains are. They just sort of exist. So, meanwhile, on the outside of all of this, Dr. Frey is looking for Sebastian. He starts investigating, which leads him to learn about the three girls and the fact that they were all given the chaplets. He tells the police that Sebastian is dangerous and may have kidnapped the girls, accusing him of killing an orderly that Dr. Frey actually had killed himself. He also gets in contact with Lucy's friend Jesse and gets him looking too. We also learn that Dr. Frey has a famous murderer named Sicarius at the ward, and if you know that name... Well, okay. I only know it because it's the name of the god of murderers and assassins in a D&D &D world I've been playing for a long time, meaning it was the funniest thing when I saw the word Sicarius come up, because I was like, I know Sicarius. He's one of the coolest gods in the Five Realms. But no, no, no. Sicarius is Latin for assassin. And so Dr. Frey has a famous murderer whose name is literally Assassin that... Um, <laughs> just at his beck and call. It's so dumb. It, it's, 
It's like casually going, oh, and I saw Mr. Axe Murderer over around the corner and expecting the audience to not think that Mr. Axe Murderer might go on to later Axe Murder. <laughs> Dr. Frey also meets up with a retired priest, um, Piazza, about Sebastian. And if you thought that maybe the choice of a psychiatrist and the focus on psych wards was like a warning side, like, you are so correct. A lot of quotes in this are probably going to be the sheer mass of anti-medicine opinions that I've just taken from the series. Because you see, the premise of the series is very much that modern day saints would be seen as mentally ill. And thus, any notion of treating mental illness is a tool against saints and religion in general. Medication is described as drugs which alter minds and control behavior, and the psych ward itself is a nest of horror. And yeah, psych wards kinda can be like that, but this is where certain distinctions must be made from fictional portrayals and real life incidents. Medical health treatment can be wrong and abusive. Psych wards especially have reputations for misery, even in ones that aren't necessarily like hellholes. But that doesn't mean that every single one is, or that the concept has anything necessarily flawed. Um, I have not been to a psych ward myself, I know people who have. It can be a real mixed bag when you put a lot of people who are generally at like some of the lowest points in their life together. It's a rough setting, but in this book, the concept of a psych ward is a tool to oppress religion, so it's all just evil. <laughs> Medication alone is rarely a full solution, too, and medication can also be wrong or take a while to get right. In real life, it's a complicated field. It's also a good field. Um, I have some pretty severe mental illness issues, and I have my entire life. I've been suggested for psych wards before. Again, I know people who have been in them. I've had all kinds of downs. I've generally, however, gotten better and better from medication and care. And the thing is, is that it is kind of a more or less morally neutral, normal thing. There's a lot of things to be discussed about it, but this, that's in real life. We're talking about a book. And in fiction, and in this book, the only ideas we're ever presented with are those which paint the entire notion of mental health and addiction as evil. This isn't some commentary, it's just a way to make it sound like Catholicism can literally cure anything. Addiction is skewered by the series 2 as a part of mental illness, which is a complicated take. I definitely think the link is obvious, addiction can be a symptom as much as of a problem. It's a pattern of behavior which can become a dependency due to unaddressed mental health issues. In the series though, drugs of any kind, <laughs> any sort, just even, probably even painkillers I bet, like the most basic stuff, paracetamol, they are evil. Drugs of any kind are all the same, and they all make you into an evil, mindless, homeless addict who loves killing. And the only cure is Catholicism. Again, as someone who has personally dealt with addictive drugs, this characterization is just extremely harmful and very annoying. So, I've talked about this before, but the series really manages to skewer some issues very close to my heart, so I have to take sections away to talk about this. Medication does not change you into another person. Medication does not, I mean, medication, it affects you, yes, but it does not alter you fundamentally, and the changes are good. Again, there's so much nuance to be had. Medication can be wrong, medication can take a while to be right, medication can be adjusted and changed in so many ways. Overall, though, proper medication is good. <laughs> It doesn't change who you are. It's nice. No medicine I've ever had has ever radically changed me beyond a bad side effect, which is just a risk. Instead, medication has gotten me unstuck and able to control my life better, leading to me being able to deal with stressors and actually do things that make me happy. With some medication, the goal might be much larger behavior shifts, but again, it is ideally done so the patient can feel more in control against the illness not to rewrite them, because medication does not rewrite people. Okay, I should get back to the book, but we're going to return to this topic later, unfortunately, and several other topics. I just have to take an aside. 
The girls and Sebastian outweigh the storm. Jesse appears to declare Sebastian as dangerous, but the girls just don't believe it at this point. Still, when the storm ends, they go their separate ways without much remark. Agnes heads home and immediately Googles the saints, giving us key information that also foreshadows the series, as very approximately, the girls are now going to live out the lives of these saints. I mean, very approximately. I don't know much about saints, but the virgin martyrs all sure sound the same. Like, all of three of these girls are Roman noble girls who were secret Christians and then got tortured and raped for it when a dangerous heathen found out. It does really sound like propaganda, the ways the stories are all similar. Like, specifically though, St. Agnes was taken to a brothel because she was Christian, only to have her hair grow over her body so she couldn't be raped. She then failed to be burned and was stabbed. St. Lucy was similarly sent to a brothel by heathens, but refused to move, eventually being lit on fire, surviving, and being stabbed. At some point, St. Lucy gouged out her own eyes to make herself less beautiful to men. And lastly, though, um, St. Cecilia was a secret Christian musician who was eventually sent to death, but even after being stabbed, continued to sing for three days. St. Sebastian, meanwhile, was another Roman secret Christian. Apparently there's a lot of these. <laughs> he is most famous now for being a gay icon, actually, which makes his role in the story a bit funnier, at least. Like, obviously, Saint Sebastian, it's not like he was gay, but the imagery of Saint Sebastian has been adopted by the gay community, so much so that when I was recently in London, um, I was looking at a uh, art tour of like LGBT themed pieces and one of the ones on there was simply a artwork of Saint Sebastian with a note of like the gay community has adopted Saint Sebastian. So the choice of him here and his three weird saint wives is kind of extra funny to me. <laughs> Cecilia goes to play a show, but she's struck by religious fervor again, beginning to roll on the floor and reopening her iron mating wounds as she sings Whipping Post. She begins to feel phantom whips strike her repeatedly, while Lucy finds herself crying blood in public. The girls never really have one moment where they discuss these events, like, with each other or in private. They never go, boy, it was weird and wild how I seem to be hallucinating religious events. Like, they never comment and say like, huh, what if the saint stuff is real? What does this mean for me? Rather, they all just live only in the moment, being horrifically tortured, but barely responding to it beyond the feeling that they all need to return to the church and Sebastian. It's sort of unsettling how much the main characters of these books don't feel like they're having human responses after, I mean, after the point where they had their religious ecstasy torture scene. After that point, they don't feel human anymore because none of them ever stop and talk about how weird the things going on are. Or even if they don't find it weird, the impact and weight of it. No one ever goes and is like, wow, being a saint sure is tough and this got sprung on me. How is this going to change my life? Like, I, I can't wait to be a saint, but... This sure gives me complicated feelings. There's no complicated feelings in the series. There's only this weird devotion, duty, and willingness to die. <laughs> Anyways, in the background, Frey is poking around still, but he's not particularly acting. He sends Ricky Pyro, that is his name, the scummy musician that Cecilia knows, to ask around. He gets Jesse thinking Sebastian is dangerous again, and he orders the police around. Still, none of this ever really amounts to anything either. There are countless opportunities to do something about these girls, and Sebastian, which Frey just utterly misses out on. He knows, for example, that Sebastian is obsessed with the Precious Blood Church, yet he never thinks to go there or order someone directly there himself until the very end of the book. The first place you look for a guy who believes he's a saint and who is obsessed with the church precious blood is probably in the church precious blood, and Dr. Frey does not make this connection. <laughs> the girls and Sebastian then meet up. He explains about ciphers a bit, again, saying they manipulate society and lead openly, seducing people into their dark agenda. Then they return to the bone torture chamber as Sebastian explains their destiny of fighting evil by inspiring people's souls. So 
this is one of the clearest times we get a mission statement for these girls. These are the four long forgotten, these are the long forgotten legends of your namesakes, martyrs who gave up their lives for something greater than themselves. Young girls, teenagers like us who changed their wor worlds by example and made the ultimate sacrifice. Human beings, but divinely inspired. Subjects of art and architecture, poems and prayers, their pictures enshrined everywhere, their names literally on everyone's lips. They were superstars for nearly 2,000 years before the world was even invented. Eternal icons. Page 227. Sebastian here is glamorizing sainthood, but in particular, glamorizing martyrdom. The message here in this book is that it's cool to die if it's religious. That you'll be famous and important if you die for your faith. That the more persecuted you feel, the more smug you get to be. It's kind of a bad message for teen girls, actually, especially, because, you know, the idea that self-harm and death are good things to pursue and equivalent to stardom, but also even better than that. Like, it's maybe a super dangerous message, right? Like, being a saint is generally... <sighs> being a saint is not, generally speaking, a choice people ever made, especially in the modern day. But this section feels as if it's meant to inspire girls to want to be saints right now. As in, like, to want to die horrifically for their church. You know, if this book series was, you know, Muslim, it would not have been published, especially at the time. But, like, if we're cutting over all of the cultural differences, obviously, between, like, Catholicism and Muslim people, like... If you just get down the basic and imagine, like, if there was a book out there that was encouraging hip Muslim teens to go die for their faith in a martyrdom, that would be not published. We can all agree that. But yet this one that has a Catholicism lean, totally fine, full trilogy, Simon and Schulster, Big Five. I keep saying Simon and Schulster like we need to email them particularly. It's just in my mind right now. It's, it's, so, it's so strange to me, just... Who approved this? You know? I mean... It's, it's so strange. It's so strange. Publishing at the time really welcomed a Christian tinge to the YA section, with so many books I've covered obviously being Christian lit, yet published and sold without being labeled as such. If you press somebody, it's obvious Halo is Christian lit, but it has always been placed in and put in YA. It's treated as a YA paranormal romance when the first tag on that book is Christian lit 100%. This book should have been a similar route, but it's not. It's treated as if this is just a casual hip thing and Christianity and Catholicism are just the default we all accept. This is a problem in publishing. It was more of a problem back in the day. I don't think that we really get as many secret Christian lit angel and demon themed books these days, um, but that's more due to trends. Like, there is this real problem in publishing that we had at the time, and this book is just the one that you look to as perhaps the worst example I've ever covered. <laughs> Anyways, Sebastian, as he explains their holy duty as saints, begins to brand himself with their milago charms while speaking religious texts. It's extremely culty. As much as there seems to be real miracles and, like, proof of God events going on, there's been no solid miracles observed by someone outside the girls and Sebastian. Opening up the interpretation, this is all a shared delusion. Definitely all the interactions between the four of them read as if this is the case, that these are three girls who are at their lowest near-death points who met a charismatic hot boy who led them into his highly specific cult with flattery and stolen charm bracelets. All three of them feel absolute love for him in the end, without any romance or kissing at all. Like, it's just an all-consuming certain love and trust born from nothing. Frey and the others learn that the girls and Sebastian are back in the church, and he calls the police and claims Sebastian is an unsafe kidnapper, again. You might notice this is about the third time I've said this. Nothing has happened. Piazzo, the priest friend of Dr. Frey, realizes suddenly that Sebastian is not delusional but a saint, so he kills himself. Sebastian runs upstairs to the main church, leaving the girls in the basement as Ricky, Pyro, and his gang show up. 
what follows is the climax of the book. I know it doesn't seem like we're at the climax of this book, but we are, so welcome. It's gonna get really violent again. The girls size up the attacking gang, who threaten them with rape and violence. They're called vandals the entire time too, a word which the book will often return to as a term for bad guys and, you know, just evil goons. The girls choose violence, and an utter bloodbath begins. Cecilia immediately decapitates a man with her guitar, while the other two girls improvise sharp bone clubs. Lucy begins to beat a man to death, but stops when she sees Agnes is being assaulted. As a man tries to rape Agnes in the middle of the fight, um, Agnes's hair grows to cover her entire body, and then she stabs him through the foot with a sword. Then her hair chokes him to death additionally. Uh, let me read that. Let me read that death scene. Sorry, I must have severed an artery, she said calmly, watching the blood wash over her flats. She let her hair and dress fall to their natural length once again, and bitch slapped him, wiping his snot from her hand on his jacket. He was weakening and unable to defend himself. You like to pull hair, she said seductively, slowly wrapping her locks around his neck and jerking him towards her. Me too. She leaned in close to him face to face, close enough to kiss under less confrontational circumstances, and tightened her grip on the, rest, on the nest of hair now encircling his throat. He saw the fire in her eyes, and she watched the life leave his slowly, like a sun setting into the horizon, degree by degree. She pulled and kept pulling, until his eyes popped and his tongue swelled past his lips, until he was dead. She untangled him and let him drop. Page 249. I'm not kidding about the violence in this book, guys. <laughs> the girls don't have a lot of personality beyond one trait, which varies and is mostly gone after accepting their sainthood. But the violence and the murder comes out of nowhere. Like, first we saw them all be tortured. That was pretty shocking. Now, these are three teen girls who have instantly dropped to full murder. Agnes, the um, hair-choking girl there, is meant to be the gentle, hopeless romantic, but she is now gleefully watching a man slowly die. And they all do. These girls are meant to be normal teens, even slightly disconnected from, like, slightly disconnected from reality or privilege. There's nothing in them that would hint at sadism, which is what this is. These aren't clean kills to defend themselves. These are fully sadistic, almost like pre-planned murder. Like, the guys here are vaguely demons, agents of evil here to kill and assault them. Go on in self-defend, but the sheer glee on display here is disturbing. Like, it's so much more than self-defense. Here's another quote. Lucy pulled at his wrist until she could get a piece of his hand into her mouth. She bit down and tore a piece of him off and spit it out on the floor beside her. He wailed in pain. She grabbed for the legan <laughs> legenda? Legenda. It's a book. She grabbed for the book at her feet and pummeled the vandal on top of her with the heavy, leather-bound book. His forearm and ribs cracked easily under the force of her blows. He released her, but she wasn't done. Lucy looked up at the windows with their scenes of tortured saints and found some inspiration. She dragged the nearly unconscious vandal on top of the altar and scooped a few still-burning coals from the toppled urn. She tugged at his jaw until it opened and turned slack, and dropped the hot charcoal into it and closed it back up with her feet. She held her foot there, kissing his lips with her soul. Soot and ash from his boiled and blistering lips soiled her shoe. You have a dirty mouth. He literally sizzled, cooked from the inside out. His screams, a pitched whistle like nothing she'd ever heard, shot up from his um, vocal tubes and out of his ears. Steam poured from his nose like a raging bull in its death throes. Payback's a bitch, even if it is a few thousand years late. Page 250. So the fighting just continues and continues. Cecilia allows herself to be whipped bloody before impaling Ricky Pyro with her broken guitar, watching him die slowly with satisfaction. With all four attackers dead, the girls don't really reflect on their sudden turn to violence or anything that has happened. Like, they decide that if killing has made them evil, they'll probably find out in the future, and they don't, and this massacre barely comes up in the next two books. They all pray for the first time in their lives, 
feeling full of strength and facing and like faith in God, obviously very pleased by what has happened. It's bizarre. It's maybe disturbing. Like, I don't want to make this a story about religious violence in the world, but I can't not mention it. This book is glorifying religious extremists and it only gets away with it because it's Christian. These girls find God through sadistic violence and there's absolutely no critical thought involved in the process. Continuing upstairs, Sebastian is being confronted by Dr. Frey and Sicarius. I mean, do you remember them? Like, let's go get another horrible anti-medication quote just in here. First of many. Sebastian said, derive... <laughs> My ability to speak is slightly worn down. Been a long time, but let's go. Sebastian said derisively, You don't offer happiness. You don't offer fulfillment. You don't offer love. You prescribe it soullessness in daily doses. Whatever works, Dr. Frey said blithely. What happens when the prescriptions run out, doctor? You get a refill, Sebastian. Here, I'm always full, Sebastian said. I don't need a refill or an insurance card or a straitjacket. Page 256. <sighs> if pills are removing my soul, bottoms fucking up. I will shake down that bottle of this stuff and I'll take them all in, man. If they're removing my soul, let's go. I need these things. <laughs> Anyways, we have a lot of quotes to go through, but I just, I feel like I need to have these quotes in here. Like, as the book constantly says, seeing is believing. And like, you gotta see this. <laughs> Here's Frey talking. Science is truth, a rigorous process of study undertaken over years to arrive at the answers to age-old questions, to separate fact from fiction. There are papers, reviewed and published, open to scrutiny. And Sebastian responds, All paid for by the like-minded doctor, ever-changing, evolving, as they say. What I know can't be bought. It is eternal. Page 256. So there's a hint of conspiracy, which we're again going to get back to later. But yes, the grand conspiracy of scientific evidence. I struggle against this argument because it's just so willfully ignorant. Like, yes, science is ever changing because the point of it is to be open minded to learning new things and changing. That is the point of science. Everything is a slow process of learning. Dr. Frey here is right, as he often is. A number of times in the series, Dr. Frey is going to say something entirely rational and normal. And it's so annoying because he's the bad guy and he will say some insane stuff as well. He will do unethical bad guy stuff and then say such like damning things like the scientific process is peer reviewed and ever growing. And we as the audience are supposed to boo him for saying that. Dr. Frey then sicks the uh, assassin Sicarius on Sebastian, and Sebastian quite easily beats him, performing the most brutal murder in the book, and I think my favorite in the series, just personally. Okay, it, it's, um, it's something. Do you renounce Satan? Sebastian asked, beginning the faux baptism ritual. With his last bit of strength, Sicarius spit the water out into Sebastian's face and tried to close his mouth. Sebastian jammed the, um, it's an aspergillum, it's a holy water wand, into his mouth and down his throat, breaking teeth and forcing his mouth to remain agape. And all his works? Sebastian continued to question Sicarius according to the ritual as he poured one bucket, then a second, then a third, down his throat until it was backing up out of his mouth, nose, and ears like an overfilled gas tank. And all his pumps? Sicarius's belly had swelled abnormally and his eyes rolled over. He was dead, drowned. Sebastian pulled the wand out of his mouth and dropped it into one of the empty buckets with a loud clang. Page 258. Dr. Frey watches this and just stands by impassively, and Sebastian similarly is utterly unmoved by the ease in which the baptism water torture came to him. The girls arrive from downstairs and flock to Sebastian's side. Then the police arrive, seeing this as a hostage situation. Jesse, who's been just sort of lurking nearby incompetently the whole book, he films this and the girls wind up going viral. 
Sebastian lunges forward to try to attack Dr. Frey, knowing he'll be shot, and is hit five times by police snipers, fulfilling his martyrdom dreams. The girls do not feel sad, as they know this is a holy act he's done, and they leave the church. The book ends. Like, yeah. That was book one. It's very tricky to summarize the plot, because there isn't really one. Three girls join a cult and murder some people, the end. There isn't really much to attach to it in terms of character or story, especially as once the girls get into being saints, they never doubt or struggle against their faith or duty. Like, not once in the series, I've complained about this before, but I'll say it again, do any of the girls say, hey, this is kind of a lot, like, what if we're wrong? Like, sure, that makes them better saintly icons to never doubt themselves, but it makes them worse characters. This book has three stars on Goodreads, one of the lowest I've actually seen for a mainstream published book from the era. And I figure that while I'm here, before we move on to book two, I should talk about some like odds and ends relating to the series. So first, the name thing. It was originally published as The Blessed, but has been since renamed as Precious Blood, book one of The Blessed. It's actually pretty rare for a book to rebrand like this. Publishing is a long series of checks and approvals and consistencies, so it can be very expensive to change all of that, or all for a title change post-publication. It certainly suggests that the series, thankfully, did not perform very well. Changing the name isn't guaranteed to get more people to pick it up, after all, but it's certainly one desperate way to try. I don't really know which I prefer between The Blessed and Precious Blood. Neither... Neither really fits with the names of the next two books. Precious Blood is more specific as a book title, but it also is a commonly used Catholic term and also sounds like a vampire book. The Blessed is quite generic, but it probably fits better. And the covers for the series also led me down an interesting journey. The original ones were rather unremarkable, but there's this portrait set that is kind of nice. It's also very modern looking. YA at the time was very big on faceless girls in ball gowns or singular objects, not dramatic front faces portraits as we usually get right now. That's because the series, which ran from 2012 to 2015, was reprinted and given new covers, but primarily and at first only in Spanish. The Goodreads reviews are also predominantly in Spanish, which is a little bit uncommon on Goodreads, which is a very English and, I would say, probably American-led site. So it's a bit cynical, but it appears that the series wasn't doing very well, and someone at Simon & Schulster had the idea to translate it and sell it to a large Spanish Catholic audience where it did better. Or, of course, which is very likely, the translation rights were already bought, but they didn't act on it for a while because it takes a while to translate it. I don't really know, this is speculation. The covers are much nicer, though. Like, I have to admit, the Catholic Saint aesthetic does go very hard, and the series is aware of that. It just also embraces a bunch of stuff I'm very not fond of along the way. So next passing note is the poetry. These books are full of very, very bad poems. It's hard to really put them in. I'm not going to put them in anywhere else in the book because they're just so bad they're not even funny, and they're also really long and just strange. But I am going to read one of them from the third book. Just because it's, I'd like to give you a taste of the poetry, but I'm not including them. They're usually in between section breaks, as it were. Okay. We are forged, licked by fire, our bond like iron, our love anointed with smoke, and green water washed in blood, made of thorns and stars, purified, burnished, branded inside, on our hearts and minds, each wound etched more deeply than the next, upon souls, skins, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, donec mors ex patre, when all there is has ceased to be, what still remains is, you and me, eternally. The poems all differ in odd capitalizations, sometimes doing every word and sometimes just skipping lines, all of them are fragmented and not even worth, like, analyzing for poetic form. They're just a bunch of line breaks and, like, vague cliches. And my last note before book two is the chapter titles in the series. I have to address them because one of the first things I noticed when I opened these PDFs 
was the chapter titles. Like many PDFs, the chapter titles are just listed on the first couple pages because that's how they format them for ebooks. And the chapter titles in this series are just off the wall. <laughs> some of them slap, some of them are embarrassing. <laughs> and well, they're worth talking about, okay? Pretty much none of them have any relevance to what actually occurs in the chapter as well. Many, many of them are song titles. I've separated the sections into a few categories for your enjoyment, but I will say I almost certainly am missing some of them that were song titles, or some of them kind of function as both and sort of are in between, okay? So, um, the first section I'd like to read to you are embarrassing Christian ones. So that is, um, Pray, Sold Out, Altered, Gospel Girl, Saint Tutorium, I Confess, yes, that's an iCarly reference, Faith Rape, Sold Out, yes, there is a second, there's Sold Out is a chapter title in both book one and three. <laughs> My next section, of course, actually slaps hard, which is Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, Moths Have Come, Blessed Be the Bones, The Gruesome and the Glory, Spirit and Teeth, and Faith Eaters. I would use many of those as actual book titles, chapter titles, I'm into these ones. The next category, though, is just like plain Christian. There's a number of these, like Divine Intervention, Spiritus Sanctus, Crucification, Metanoia, Gratia Plena. Great. It's Christian Catholic in it. And the last section, far from all of them, is that's just the song title. The Black Parade, Fairy Tale of New York, Hell is for Children. Starfucker, but they censor Starfucker. Like, nothing else in this book is censored. They say fuck all the time in this book, honestly, but they do censor Starfucker. I'm very, very, very into chapter and section titles in books. I always put a lot of work into them in my books. Like, um, so I'm just always very obsessed when books have them. I just want to touch one of my books just instinctually. <laughs> so, much like how I thought a lot of the prose was good despite the content being rank, I really like a few of the chapter titles. The Moths Have Come is fantastic, I'm gonna steal that. Gruesome in the Glory really fits into like the 2018 YA fantasy book naming bingo, and Blessed Be the Bones, extremely strong. Anyways, detour over. Book two is called Passionaries, a word that looks made up, and it introduces the Pope as a main character. I'm not lying to you. I would never do that. The Pope is in this series and he drinks Lucy's blood. Book two. I'm here. I took off my jacket. I'm going to pronounce words so good this time. <laughs> I sometimes get questions about my pronunciation. I just, um, I struggle sometimes to pronounce words, but I do my best, okay? <laughs> The second book jumps forward a few months. The girls have gone their separate ways. No one was charged of any crime for the massacre at Precious Blood. It's just not remarked on. And nothing has changed because of it. But the girls are now famous as saints. You think someone would say something about, again, the brutalized corpses in the basement, but evidently self-defense covers hot coal torture. The split between the three girls in theory should show something about them, like mean they now have to contend with normal life after being so changed in the church, but the book hardly cares about that. They're there until they, like, they're separate, and then they meet up again. And the main drive to the book is usually just Dr. Frey sends people to kill them. They reunite, whatever. Early on, though, before we get to the broader plot, I do want to comment on something Cecilia says. So... Early on, Cecilia is watching a parade of Our Lady of Sorrows, which is a Catholic thing around the sorrows of the Virgin Mary. Cecilia thinks this as she watches. It was a celebration of sadness, but it wasn't sad. In fact, it was a collective, if not joyful, release. Couldn't get any more oppositional, more punk than that. An annual Good Friday funeral for everyone to cry and let go. Page 9. Calling Catholicism punk is one of the greatest crimes in the series. Punk is a funny term, but it is by default oppositional. It's a subculture of the powerless and the downtrodden rising against conformity and mainstream culture. Catholicism, one of the largest religions and institutions in the world, cannot be considered punk by any margin. Like, sure, maybe a parade honoring death is a bit punk, it sounds pretty cool and all, but it's Catholicism. 
Like, I don't think it's an insult to point out it simply can't be considered punk by any margin. But Cecilia, her aesthetic is punk rock, she is a punk rock musician, and it's constantly opposed with the fact that she is calling Catholicism and Christianity punk. It's not punk. <laughs> Anyways, Cecilia goes and gets a tattoo with Sebastian's ashes. Agnes is bullied at school for saint stuff, and Lucy is just sort of aimless. All feel committed to this mission that Sebastian gave them to fulfill their roles, but that is never, like, addressed. He didn't tell them what to do. When he told them they were reborn saints who had to perform miracles, his instructions went no further. Yet they have no doubt, like, just no questions. That's the same tepid determination which makes all three girls feel so identical at this point. Meanwhile, we get to see a cipher meeting. Buckle in. The ciphers are the bad guys, but this one meeting is the only actual scene about them, leaving it still unclear who they are and what their goal is besides just control and hating Christians. Their membership is listed as a senator, international bank chairman, hedge fund CEO, Ivy League university president, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, telecom magnate, ad agency founder, music or producer, and of course the psychiatrist Dr. Frey. That is what we are given for who these ciphers are. And right off the top, we're going to address the whole secret society controlling the world conspiracy thing as anti-Semitic. The idea that Jewish people secretly control all finances and media and universities in order to control and indoctrinate people against the Christian truth is one of the most popular and harmful conspiracies out there. It's one that's extremely old, but still going strong and literally part of the reasoning for the Holocaust. It's extremely harmful. Why am I bringing Jewishness up here when the book hasn't? Well, the thing with conspiracies is that they tend to work on levels like that. At first it's just, oh, a bunch of wealthy elites decide all politics ahead of time, it's all a sham to control the people. And slowly it unravels until you realize that anytime people say wealthy elites, they usually mean Jewish people. There's a classic bit that somebody does which is asking conspiracy theorists a very simple question. It's a great thing to ask any conspiracy theorist. Who is doing the lying? And the answer winds up being Jewish people, <laughs> like pretty much every time. Did you know that even Flat Earth is like this? Um, one of my flatmates did a lot of research into Flat Earth, and did you know that Flat Earth sounds silly and stupid, the idea that anybody could think the world is hiding edges? But the next level down in the conspiracy, you realize it's actually all about Christianity. Many Flat Earthers specifically believe in Flat Earth because it's linked to the Bible and certain Bible quotes and the idea that God made this way, and there's the firmament and the um, dome covering it. So when you ask who is covering up the edge of the earth and what could they possibly gain from this, the answer winds up being evil Jewish people trying to, you know, tamper down on Christianity. It's exhausting, and that is unfortunately the truth with a lot of conspiracy theories. So the people listed as ciphers here, the wealthy elite who secretly control culture for the last 2,000 years, are notably primarily in careers associated with anti-Semitic conspiracies, too. They only are in media production, finance, and universities. There's a couple extra weird ones in there. There's one senator, which is kind of a low political office when you think of it like that. And yeah, personally, if I had to gather a list of careers to control the world, I... I wouldn't, because that's not how the world works, but I also would probably shoot more for politics, oil, and certain things like that, not the chairman of a university. A chairman of an Ivy League university, definitely not controlling the world. Funny how he's here. A psychiatrist, just one New York psychiatrist, I don't think that I would normally put down as influential people in the world stage, a psychiatrist. Funny how he's here, huh? So Dr. Frey is explaining to his fellow ciphers about the girls, and they're not pleased that he's let it get out of control like this. We get the tiniest scrap of lore here, and my second favorite quote out of context. Um, <laughs> okay, this quote out of context, I love it. It has taken our kind nearly 2,000 years to undo the events in Bethlehem, the tech wizard insisted, page 26. Also, interesting use of 
our kind. Not our company, our organization, our kind. Hmm. Here's another quote. Be that it may, we are the ancestors of the brave and the powerful, of Herod, of Pilate, of Maximus Thrax, the ad agency executive shot back, of those who sent their kind to the lions, the chopping, cro the chopping block, the cross. Page 26. Now this is the only lore we really get about ciphers, and it's interesting. Note the cipher here using ancestor. I don't think this is a mistake. It could be. It's a very weird word choice. Because it's ancestor, not descendants. This suggests that they have all been alive since the time of Jesus or before, and their descendants are the figures listed. Um, so Herod is a Jewish king who did all the whole, like, killing all newborn baby things in an attempt to, like, kill Jesus. Pilati is the guy who held Jesus' trial and sent him to be crucified. Maximus Thrax is my next D&D character, and also a Roman Empire who, emperor who persecuted Christians. So let's try and cross some threads here, okay? I think I'm building a lovely picture. Ooh, my own conspiracy board. I don't think this is that much of a stretch. All the figures the cipher listed as being related to are related to the persecution of Christians under Roman rule. Yes. Two of them are specifically related to trying to and successfully killing Jesus Christ. Here's a fun fact. A number of Christians today fully blame Jewish people for the death of Jesus. Still. And this link is the root to much ancient anti-Semitism. By linking the evil conspiracy council explicitly to the death of Jesus, well, more and more, it doesn't seem like such a stretch for me to bring Jewish people into this. A global conspiracy linked to Jesus' death where bankers and media titans scheme to oppose Christians. Hmm. So, like, anyway, fuck these books. <laughs> I feel like I'm going off on way more tangents than I usually do while writing plot summaries, but I can't really help it. I think these are all important contexts that I want to discuss when it comes to discussing these books. My videos aren't really book reviews at this point. They are book reviews. These are my thoughts about the books I read. But they do follow into that weird gray area of essay where I need to discuss these books on a deeper level. And that includes discussing the fact that this is so obviously really anti-Semitic. <laughs> anyways. Anyways. The ciphers discuss how difficult it is to stop the girls because, um... The empowerment message they are peddling is resonating across the board and does not need to be merchandised and therefore cannot be co-opted, page 28. Which is hilarious sentiment in a world where every makeup and cosmetic company is peddling a be-yourself message and making bank. The ciphers tell off Dr. Frey, who assures them he'll deal with the girls, and we never see the ciphers again. I mean, there's one later in book three. But no, we, we never see them again, we never get more explanations on them. Cecilia is playing a show, and while the other girls go to support her, she has had stigmata ever since she fell into the Iron Maiden, which is um, a condition of your palms bleeding in a way to like Jesus was nailed to the cross through his palms. Stigmata is the wounds from the nails, and so somebody experiencing stigmata is somebody who is just bleeding from the palms like Jesus. Great. So anyway, Cecilia has that, and they now bleed to tell her whenever evil is afoot. They are magic stigmata. Somebody notices a strange man above the stage messing with the lighting rig, and Cecilia just throws three milagos like ninja fighting stars impaling him. After the show, she meets up her homeless friend Bill. So Bill was a drug and alcohol addict last book, he showed up a little bit, and was kind of just a nice character, her friend. Um, but he reveals now in this book that he is now clean because he was so inspired by Cecilia. Certainly the framing in these books, where homeless addicts typically are the faceless bad guys, is quite specific. Bill is a good guy. He is the one good homeless addict. And to prove it, he is able to overpower years of addiction in like a month because he's Christian now. Shortly after he reveals this, he is stabbed in the street in front of Cecilia and dies. This would be sad, except like in the first book, Bill fully calls somebody a certain transphobic slur starting with T. 
So I don't know if I'm like here to mourn Bill yet. <laughs> the girls then learn that Sebastian's heart was stolen after his death and that Dr. Frey is looking for it. As a holy relic, he wants to destroy it and they obviously want it back. Cecilia confronts Dr. Frey but finds nothing, while Jesse lurks around with his shady connections to help. While Dr. Frey and the Cyphers in theory want to stop the girls, they actually take no action against them besides occasionally sending homeless addicts to go and try to murder them. I I'm not kidding, I'm skipping over a lot of, you know, small scenes in these books. And when I skip over the scenes in these books, multiple times they are just scenes where like a homeless drug addict tries to assassinate the girls so they beat him up. Multiple times, I swear to you. So, um... <laughs> As much as there might be room to, like, use some of those vast resources the Cyphers control to bury the story of the saints or discredit them or do literally anything, most of the book and books, the girls and Frey meet multiple times and just sort of part ways neutrally. Like, they're rivals just being like, oh, I'll get you next time. Cecilia runs to confront Dr. Frey about Bill's murder, but it achieves nothing and, as usual, ends with everyone walking away unharmed. Much like the previous book, the plot is very difficult to describe, even having like read it closely, taken extensive notes, and having reread a lot of sections in order to like write all of this up. It's just extremely scattershot, and then it's overshadowed by these heinous takes. At one point, Lucy dreams about Sebastian and fingering his wounds, which... I will read to you because I would frankly feel guilty if I didn't include the full text of the wound fingering scene. The series has more than one wound fingering scene, which is lifted from like typical Saint mythos, but it's still a delightful phrase to inflict on someone. One by one, he brought her fingers to the wounds in his chest and stomach. She felt the jagged edge around the fleshy rim of each gunshot. He pushed her finger in deeper, inside of each bullet hole. I'm sorry, Sebastian. So sorry for doubting you. Seeing, he said, a note of sadness in his voice, is believing. Page 75. The search for Sebastian's heart leads the girls and Jesse independently to a halfway house connected to Dr. Frey called Born Again. This rehab center for the homeless and mentally ill is identified as a hotbed of evil. <laughs> This shelter is where all of the random evil guys the girls sometimes stumble into come from. At one point, they're even attacked waiting for a subway by a homeless man from there, and the book's not-so-subtle bias and opinions are heavily expressed around Born Again. Which has a Christian name, of course, but the idea is that it's a Christian-like themed front by Dr. Frey. One minor character expresses the idea that the halfway house was trying to keep him doped up and dependent, which prevented him from staying clean and starting fresh before he's ultimately murdered. Dr. Frey is described as a personality pimp selling people more acceptable versions of themselves than a 10 milligram chewable. That's too many little quotes I just did there. Which is dumb, because very few medications are chewable. I didn't have the ability to swallow meds for a very long time, and it was real hard to get chewable. I had to get liquid medication for a lot of things, and that's hard to do, so <laughs> that's the main problem with that quote. Oh, and also, like, while I'm here, that's not how mental illness works. I might blow a gasket if I have to keep recounting the hate crimes against the mentally ill in this book, but I feel it's valuable to keep on the subject when it comes up and discuss the views in this book in order to better understand why they're so flawed. So some of the wildest parts in the series come from Dr. Frey in this book and how he often stands as a villain who is continuously correct, but is also, of course, a demonic evil sadist. Every so often, he'll have a, like, a conversation with another character which serves no other purpose than expressing the author's beliefs. And during it, Dr. Frey will state something very obviously logically good, but meant to be bad. So that's going to come up. One plot thread in this book not yet mentioned is that the Vatican has heard of these saint girls and is planning to send an expector to verify they are indeed saintly miracle workers. Dr. Frey is close to the papal messenger and yet plans to use this link to stop the girls, with him and the papal messenger working together to try and stop the Vatican miracle verifier from verifying them when he arrives. They don't know who will be doing this job, though. And in one conversation with this, um, you know, 
archbishop guy that he has a connection with. Dr. Frey says this, okay? As I pursued my career in psychiatry, I met others who thought as I did, who found other ways to help the troubled, the addicted. The sinful, the archbishop posited. Some people see those problems as a moral failing. Some do, Frey acknowledged, but not you. No. Page 116. Now, in another book, that quote, with no context, is probably about, like, a brave doctor who dared to take a humanist approach to treatment in opposition to a hardline religious approach. In this one, Dr. Frey is evil and his opinions hold no nuance. He represents the entire concept of treating the mentally ill, and he is wrong. It's hard for me to even level with this argument because it's simply wrong. Like, I don't like acting like objective opinions exist, but also being an addict or troubled is never a moral failing. Of course it isn't. Like, one does not cackle evilly as they decide to gain a crippling mental illness. By understanding how the situations around someone's life has led them to trouble or addiction, we can look at how to help them out of it. This is very normal and evident psychology. Here, that was not radical in 2013. Another character soon comes to argue with Dr. Frey again, this time the police chief, who will wind up as a good guy, again drawing clear links between the opinions each character has and some amor like apparent moral hierarchy. Here's Dr. Frey again. We don't warehouse substance abusers anymore, like return packages in a dead letter office, Captain. We treat them to the best of our ability, with the best medical technology, medications, and cognitive therapies at our disposal, and return them to society. We seek to rehabilitate them. Not everybody can be rehabilitated, or should be, Murphy countered. The jails are full of the consequences of their bad decisions, and the cemeteries. Page 138. This is the same view as before, but restated. Dr. Frey is again the villain here. The belief here is that just simply big in Christianity, I know, but that doesn't mean that I can't find it frustrating. Morality is a liquid concept which has very few true answers. Whether it be addicts, the mentally ill, or criminals, I believe in rehabilitation and care and the ability to change. I'd argue that it's a very Christian principle to feel this way too. Like, my understanding as someone not raised with Christianity at all has always been that, you know, the big JC was very big on the notion of forgiveness, change, and growth. Like, I think that rehabilitating criminals and people like that and not viewing their sins as something that is permanently tattooed on you, that sounds very Christian to me from my limited understanding. But the Blessed, however, is just extremely Catholic and extremely sure that one mistake should doom you forever. That you simply may be evil and are weak for any impurity that happens to you. That you probably earn suffering. And while it's noble for Christians to suffer, if you're homeless, you might as well go be right fucked for having obviously bad vibes and letting this happen to you. The other thing here, not direct but here with it all, is the notion of prisons as being full of people who deserve to go there. It's hard to know what to do with people who have done heinous crimes, like, I get that, but most people in the prison system, straight up, are non-violent offenders who likely made a mistake or were pushed through unfortunate circumstances. A criminal is not a demon, a criminal is a human. <sighs> like, god, okay, this is turning way too much into crow's opinions or crow- crow opinions? Crow opinions, those are kind of feather that birds are. I hope it's still fun. <laughs> the middle of the book continues waiting around aimlessly. We learn where Sebastian's heart is. It was stolen by some faithful as a saintly relic and is worshipped now in an old Italian woman's house. Later, everyone in that house is murdered and Dr. Frey steals the heart back. Agnes meets a new boy at school named Finn, who also recently attempted suicide and was looked after by Dr. Frey. This cannot be a romance because Agnes is basically soul married to Sebastian, yet Agnes's friend Hazel tries to push them together. We soon learn, though, that Finn works for Dr. Frey, who pays him in prescription sleeping pills and opiate painkillers to try and seduce Agnes and then corrupt her. This doesn't work because Agnes is simply too good of a saint girl to ever face trials and temptations, and Finn soon attacks her when she refuses his advances. His actions of anger are described as a drug-fueled attack before Agnes fights him off. The wise will note here that the two things he's prescribed are both sedatives. It's not a drug-fueled attack. 
I have taken sleeping pills. I have taken opiates before. Um, I think that Finn would probably, his drug-fueled attack would be having a little nap. I can tell you that much. Anyways, later Finn is found dead in a plot point that is mostly used in book three and primarily just forgotten about. Meanwhile, Jesse, remember him, he heads to Born Again house again to search for the girls due to a miscommunication. While the girls generally talk to each other, they never remember to communicate with Jesse and that Jesse is part of the main cast, which leads to Jesse spending most of the book out of the loop and off on the sidelines, as he did last book. He approaches Born Again again scoffing that it looks nice inside as a waste of tax dollars. Legitimately, Jesse walks into this place and he's like, whoa, it has wallpaper and looks homely? What a waste of tax dollars. Because I assume he believes that anybody who's homeless should be living in a um, just literal prison cells. <laughs> That's the implication. Anyways, he scoffs around there and then he's promptly attacked and crucified. <laughs> Mind, Jesse is the aggressor here the entire time. He breaks into the halfway house, immediately starts shit with the first person he sees, and then is crucified. Which is maybe an overreaction to a home invasion, but Jesse did have it coming. His attacker takes a photo of him crucified as a memento on Jesse's phone and just strolls away. The girls then show up at Born Again, looking for Sebastian's heart, and find Jesse crucified to the wall. He's left in a coma for the rest of the book, but he'll be back in the next one. While Lucy is leaving the hospital from visiting Jesse, she is ambushed and mid-paragraph chloroformed and brought to the uh, cardinal papal messenger friend of Dr. Frey. The um, cardinal, I think I called him an archbishop earlier, I might be getting my titles confused, but cardinal also wishes to stop the girls and has abducted Lucy to torture and interrogate her on her being an alleged saint. What he exactly hopes to achieve is not the clearest. The other girls follow Dr. Frey's car to where Lucy is being held. In the meantime, the Cardinal bothers Lucy, telling her that she hasn't suffered enough to be a martyr and is basically like stolen valor sainthood right now. Dr. Frey arrives, carrying Sebastian's preserved heart, and they set up a video camera to record them, I guess, torturing and imprisoning a famous teenage girl? They state their goal is to discredit her so that when the papal miracle verifier guy shows up, Lucy will not be seen as a saint and her credibility will be gone. But again, this scheme loses a lot of legs when you consider the chloroforming and torture of a teenage girl on video. <laughs> Agnes uses her briefly mentioned rarely used power, I don't need to mention it again, <laughs> I'm introducing it now, of body projection, astral projection, to see Lucy being tortured, then returns to tell her friends, um, also outside, that they should hurry up. Considering that's what they were here to do, it's a real waste of an ability she never uses again. While she's far-seeing, though, Cecilia is left to murder three priests. Well, um, not priests. People dressed up as priests, I guess. And I keep saying this, but these might be the worst murders yet. I don't want to type this one out and read it out loud. As you can clearly tell, I have, as I'm currently reading it out loud from having typed it up. I don't want to, though. But I will, and I think I deserve a medal for what I'm going to read. <laughs> the only needed context is that her homeless transphobe friend Bill left her an Indian curved sword known as an Aru Arumi? Arumi. And she is instantly talented at this sword and wears it as a belt. It didn't seem like that important of a detail to mention earlier. She has a whip sword now. And the following scene is just unbelievable. It lasts a few pages, so I'm going to clip it down, but I am going to read most of it. I should also probably note more than anything so far, this book looks and reads a lot like fetish content and has some references to whipping and daddy kink in a sexual context. And I think I should just let you know that before we get into it and like mentally prepare your like take a moment, take a moment, breathe in, just mentally prepare yourself for this one. Okay, let me try and remember, how am I even making- I don't want to read this one, okay. Oh god. What if I just take a long sip of water? We're all going to mentally prepare for what I have to read. Okay. 
Okay. Cecilia took a few steps back, reached for her belt, and unfastened it. The guards tensed up, ready for an attack. You know, she mused, when I was little, my father warned me that I was going to get punished by taking off his belt and hanging it from the chair of the kitchen table. Maybe that's why you have a thing for older guys. Cecilia heard the diss and recognized the, it as the voice of the man who'd murdered Bill. That if I pun pushed him just a tiny bit further, I was going to get it, she continued, stepping closer. I knew that he meant business, knew what was in store for me, but somehow I just couldn't stop myself. Come to daddy, naughty girl, one said, wagging his fingers. Cecilia smiled. Time for a spanking. Are we going to fight or fuck? The guard said, laughing. Are you going to whip me for being bad? The other mocked, licking his lips. Cecilia let the Urumi unspool, taking the two thin metal straps hitting the floor with a springy metallic crack. Whip you, she said flatly. No, I would never whip you, she paused. I'm going to cut the tips of your fingers off, then I'm going to slice off your ears, then your balls, before cutting you into little pieces. That's what I do to bad boys. The guards rushed Cecilia. She whirled the belt sword around her like a helicopter blade and struck, slicing up the first attackers. His legs were cut off at the knees and he dropped to his bloody stumps, crying out in agony. Change of plans, she said, as splintered bone and shredded flesh splashed the walls and floor around them. It's a killer accessory, don't you think? The fight continues. Cecilia at one point levitates and makes like a crown of bullets. A second angular stroke as she descended across both of their thighs, cut through their pants and through their femoral arteries. Both men writhed in pain, immobilized, torrents of blood spewing from terminal wounds. Bleed for me, boys, Cecilia said, standing over them, not a hint of remorse or satisfaction in her eyes. She watched them grow paler and colder as the puddles of ooze quickly expanded and thickened. She approached the first attacker, who was still squirming on the floor. He tried to raise himself. She kicked him hard in the jaw and sent him sprawling, a smear of his own blood trailing him. You're no better than us, he spat, bits of his teeth dribbling out of his swollen lips. Maybe, she admitted, surveying the carnage she'd wrought. Who makes you judge a jury? This isn't a trial, she replied. He struggled to right himself, cursing her name. You want to get up, she asked. Let me help you. She grabbed him by the hair and pulled him until he was balanced on his bloody stumps, upright. His screams echoed through the grand foyer as protruding bones and severed nerves scraped the marble tile. Cecilia dragged the Urumi from side to side through his blood, pooling behind, beneath him. His, drag, his death just drags out for a while. Cecilia looked into his eyes and looked back at him, heavy-lidded, fading fast but croaking the song with his last watery breath. I said, if there's a hell below, we're all gonna go. I don't know how the song goes. Okay. You first, she rasped, pulling the handle of the whip, launching his head from his body like a champagne cork from a bottle of New Year's bubbly. That's page 210 to 212. And it might be the worst of them. I'm gonna say that every time, but um, some of the things I read there. I didn't originally tell anybody when I first read the scene. I just sort of forgot about it until I was writing this section of the review. And it might be the perfect answer for what this series is. The book has a motto, it's seeing is believing, and that applies to this scene and this book. Seeing this book is believing it. And that belief is that it is a real, serious, actual book. And no, to just circumvent some people, I don't believe it's fetish content. I think it is rather an author trying to make saints and Catholicism seem badass and biblical too, hearkening to the original and often gory stories of the saints. But this was a bad idea, <laughs> especially as the end result is very much the sort of thing I do not believe was meant to be seen as a fetish, but which I'm certain a number of people I have seen on the internet would happily consume as fetish content. Um, I think a lot of people are probably into, say, the Catholic sadist teen girl torture and mauling um, some men dressed as priests while also vaguely sexually taunting them. There's a lot of people on the internet who would be very, very into that, and I don't think the author would like that, but hey. So the girls... <laughs> 
The girls rush into where Lucy is being held. Sebastian's spirit, like, bursts from the canister holding his preserved light, and Lucy suddenly feels calm and inspired, and grabs one of the torture tools the Cardinal has been threatening with her, her with, and just gouges out her eyes. Suddenly, the diplomatic motorcade with the papal miracle checker shows up outside, and it's the Pope. It's the Pope himself. Lucy is on the floor rapidly dying from removing her eyes, and the Pope just strides in there. He kneels by her to bless her. She hands him Sebastian's heart, and he watches her bleeding out, not really raising an eyebrow at the whole video camera torture room going on, or whatever was left of those guys Cecilia killed, which obviously will never be mentioned again. The Pope then, well, um, so the Pope does this. The pontiff placed his fingers near Lucy's cheek, took a, her tear of blood, and brought it to his lips. The sweetest taste filled his mouth and lingered on his tongue. Her tears of blood turned to milk and honey, his holiness said. Santa Lucia, he declared, raising his eyes upward. Pray for us. 2.18. Lucy then dies on the floor peacefully. The pope holds a funeral for her at Precious Blood. We just sort of skip to her funeral, not addressing again what anybody made of the pieces of men and blood in the foyer. I don't know if the Pope even saw that, but presumably, considering the girls had to walk through it, he had to walk through it too. And it just drives me insane how there's no consequences for the murders in these books. It drives me so insane. Anyways, the Pope holds her funeral at Precious Blood Church as the fallen action just takes place. Lucy's distant father, only mentioned like once up to this point, a little bit, he shows up to cry and be converted to Catholicism. The Pope then gathers the girls to brief them on the fact they must be strong and not afraid and that he can't help them anymore. Now, the main obstacle in these girls' lives at this point, vaguely, that they are, is that they are sure that they are saints, but that the ciphers are trying to dispute this. The Pope has now can, like, canonified Lucy as a saint, or at least begun the um, saintly process, as it does take like five or ten years to do. But the Pope has begun it. He has acknowledged her as a literal saint. And as such, one would expect the other two girls would follow suit. They're obviously alive now, but they're clearly blessed, and their friend is 100% a saint, and they claim they too are saints. I think it's pretty hard to just, dis like, dispute this. Once the Pope gets involved, these girls are saints. Yet there is another book, and the Pope has a surprisingly little impact. It's very hard to place any of these events in this book into reality, but the, at the inclusion of the Pope into the situation of claimed divinity, you would expect that the girls have won, at least in the Catholic view of things. Like, they are saints reborn now in the eyes of the Catholic faith. The Pope is the leader of Catholicism. He has the right to declare that. The ciphers are obviously powerless in the face of that. But we still have one more book that will ignore all this logic, so like, whatever. The book ends with Jesse having a dream about Lucy's spirit waking him up from his crucifixion-induced coma, while the other two girls are just thrown into a psych ward suddenly. While this is the end, I am actually going to carve out another space to talk about something from the second book for a little bit, and that is Jude. Uh, Jude was mentioned once already. He is a mute plot device boy. He was in the psych ward originally. He's actually kind of an important minor character. He has a storyline in book two which has absolutely no bearing on anything else around it, and I want to talk about it a lot. The thing is, it's a unique oddity in that there is something very good in this book about Jude, which is only good for a very bad reason. Like, please follow along here. So Jude was in the first book at Frey's psych ward, where he actually first appeared beating his hands bloody by attacking a Jesus statue for unclear reasons. He was friends of Sebastian and acts as the like ever obligatory innocent in this Christian story. Much like in The Commandment, his role is to be vulnerable and have suffered so he could be protected by Christian adults and ultimately saved. He exists solely as a plot function, really, to like tell off the bad guys when Sebastian randomly possesses him, or to otherwise make certain characters look good or bad based on their treatment of him. Yu doesn't really have much for personality or traits otherwise, he is a plot device. Jude is described, though, by a reoccurring nun named Sister Dorothea in this way. So this is um, somebody asking about Jude. 
But is he classified as autistic, nonverbal? His outbursts are diagnosed as seizures, his behavior is ADHD, oppositional defiance disorder, or whatever the clinical flavor of the moment may be, the sister explained. This is how Dr. Frey is able to keep him in his care. Page 112. Now, Jude is a badly written plot device, so it's hard to know what he actually is, and I don't trust Dorothea's take, as later she just calls him autistic. It's clear he's a neurodivergent child, and I think nonverbal autistic is probably the correct way to describe him based on some of his actions. But all of this was about setting up something good in this book, right? What, I mean, like, what, whatever could be good about all of this sort of harrowing setup? Like, I mean, <laughs> when I introduce a nonverbal autistic child as a plot device, whatever could be good in this book about that portrayal? Well, it's good in a bad way, and it's about police violence. So late in the book, absolutely randomly, and I swear entirely unrelated to anything else, Dorothea is called to Jude's foster home. And um, Murphy, the uh, police chief at New York City's only cop, apparently, as he's in every scene with the police, is talking to Dorothea. And he says, gas leak, suspicious, three dead, carbon monoxide poisoning, young boy inside, armed and resistant. And Dorothea, he's not resisting, he's scared. He's disabled, Captain. Autistic, Dorothea advised, intruding on the conversation. You know the boy? Yes, I've taught him, she advised. He will listen to me. All right, come with me. Murphy took the nun gently by the arm and escorted her slowly to the front door, where several more armed officers were positioned. She stepped through the front door and Jude let out a horrible wail. She'd heard it before. On playgrounds, when noisy garbage trucks rolled through, or when the jackhammer piston of Con Ed workers tore up the street, or when somebody unexpectedly sneezed. When Jude was overloaded, he was impossible to reason with, in a total fight-or-flight mode. At school, it might just warrant a trip to the nurse's office. Now, it could mean a trip to the morgue. It's okay, Jude. It's okay. Murphy signaled his men to stand down temporarily. Sister Dorothea got on her knees and opened her arms to the boy, who inched forward, still holding the knife. She could see tears running down his cheek. He stepped closer, and the officers raised their tasers, ready to fire. Jude dropped the knife and ran into Sister Dorothea's arms. Page 199. And this bit killed me when I first read it, because it is actually good in a way. As much as Jude is a tool of the narrative, there's enough details around here to suggest the author actually has some experience with autism, or has researched it a bit. Most lazy inclusions just put the kid in train track onesies and make him sensitive. The sudden sneeze bit feels built off of experience. As much as people talk about... Honestly, in a lot of books I read, people aren't even aware of things like overloading and overstimulation for autism as a thing. I've read a lot of books with really bad autism... For, well, they usually don't even label it autism, but you know special boy, special little boy, special needs sort of things. And it's obviously supposed to be autism, but they won't even call it that. They put the kid in like train track onesies and they make him cry a bit and be mostly silent. And there's enough small details around here that despite all of the other weird stuff, like for example, being autistic does not make you automatically disabled, that it's a neurotype, it's a different kind of thing. There is something um, upsettingly real about this. This is a scene where police nearly shoot with a taser a six-year-old boy because of his trauma response isn't typical, and that is an extremely real thing. He is having a meltdown, understandably, and the police see him clutching a knife and not responding to them, and they dis assume, despite his ridiculous youth of being six, he might be a threat. Even when he's complying, they are completely ready to tase him. He starts walking towards Dorothea, listening to her, just clutching a knife, but not even in a hostile way, and they prepare to shoot him. This scene thus, as you can see, just... It drove me insane, because it's a good scene in a lot of ways, and it's portraying something you just rarely ever see. Just ever. It's fully believable, and it's horrible for that. And also, it's in this garbage series, and it, here comes the second half of all these scenes in the storyline, and just why it exists, okay? Jude horrendously more traumatized, clutches on to Dorothea. The police inform her that he's going back to the psych ward immediately. 
Dorothea suggests he could stay for her one night as the police finish things up, but no, Jude is just dragged away sobbing, and for the rest of the book, Dorothea tries to visit him and is denied. The reason the good scene about police brutality with autistic children was written, as with everything else, was just another way for the book to teach you that the psych ward is evil and nuns are good. It's no deeper or more complex than that. There's no real care for depicting a serious thing that happens with autistic people to this day all the time, honestly, and very rarely covered. It's only there because it's trying to make a point, of course. It's Jude suffers and is made to suffer because he's innocent. He's literally called, as he's dragged away, a lamb to the slaughter. It's not subtle. And all of Jude's suffering boils down to random acts of violence to make the good guys look good. This isn't really about if Jude should have been kept by Dorothea, or if a psych ward can just hold a newly re-orphaned six-year-old boy indefinitely. None of that matters. Jude isn't a character, and any effort to make him momentarily well-written is all in service to making mental health institutions even more evil in this world. Book three. So, book three is called The Hollowed, because again, the naming conventions in the series aren't really that sensical. Last book ended with Cecilia and Agnes being sent to a psych ward Dr. Frey controls, with Agnes being committed by her mother, Martha, and Cecilia being blamed for the murder of Finn, the boy Agnes nearly dated. I didn't talk a lot about it with them being institutionalized because it just happens very suddenly and quickly right after the Pope canonizes Lucy, and it wasn't really that important, believe it or not. It's hardly important to the third book in the series, which begins with them both in lockup. Throughout the books, they've been visiting this place non-stop, but Dr. Frey finally has them in their grasp. And he will do pretty much nothing, and they will leave very soon, of course, as usual. Book three, again, hollowed, is quite the trip. The writing is on the wall of how the series will end, mostly, but it's still astonishing to see it play out so sincerely. While the girls are pretty much official Catholic saints due to the Pope, they continue to have no actual power because of this. Cecilia's prints were found on the murder weapon of Finn, and is held just for that. The many actual murders she has done evidently were just miracled away by God so that she could never be linked to them. Agnes was committed by her mother, Martha, who has been significantly reoccurring the entire series, though kind of unimportant. She's a very emotionally abusive woman who is pretty resoundedly the worst. Though the book believes this is because she doesn't exist, Agnes is really a saint, rather than her just being a bad parent. Jesse is still in a coma, but he'll wake up soon enough. The girls are given unnamed various meds and even electroshock therapy, just for no real reason. Jude is also still here, still being pursued by Dorothea and taunted by Dr. Frey. This is about Jude. Jude was no longer sure if the doctor saw him as a source of irritation or whether he was simply using Jude to taunt himself. Either ways, his displease and Jude's indifference was evident. His words began to flow more quickly maniacally, as if he was running out of time at a college lecture and trying to get every thought out. What you are suffering from is a kind of child abuse, a deep psychological and emotional trauma foisted on you, by first by Sebastian, then by the church. Frey opined, foamy white spittle collecting at the sides of his mouth. This is the power of religion. It makes saints out of the confused and the vulnerable and glorifies them through the stupid and superstitious. It amplified the young person's penchant for make-believe and naivete with disastrous results. Jude dropped his chin to his chest, almost as if he'd gone to sleep on the doctor's scathing dissertation. Frey barely noticed and continued with his speechifying bringing with it guilt and shame and internal damnation. I bring you relief from such supposed morality. Freedom. Jude's head suddenly snapped upright, his pupils widened, and his eyes focused squarely on Frey. But no soul, doctor, the boy said in a voice that was not his own. Nothing inside. Frey was stunned. Not only had the mute boy spoken, but at the familiarity of the tone. The doctor recognized it. He held up a prescription bottle of psychoactive medications, rattled them, and twisted off the child protective cap, opening it. Don't bother looking for too deeply inside yourself for a soul, Jude. It's right in here. Page 29. So this is specifically Sebastian speaking through Jude, to be clear, as he does a few times in the series. And here we get 
Oh, man. Okay, so I want to talk about the plot. I do. I do. But geez, here's another bit about religion and the entire notion of mental health being at war. Specifically, I want to point out the line about guilt and morality. It's something that we saw in The Commandment, that insane book about a vaccine that could kill God. Morality being linked to Christianity and villains who cheer at the death of it. It's this bizarre conspiracy you see in extremist religious areas that to not be religious or specifically Christian means you are incapable of understanding mor morals and that religion exists partially to tell people what is good or bad as humans can't possibly work that out on their own. It's a big pet peeve of mine that's just been snuck in here. Dr. Frey really never acts or discusses morality in any other way otherwise, but there it is, just a little sneaky bit there. The plot leaves the psych ward really quickly, as Cecilia is soon gone out by a, na a man named Daniel Less. Less is a recorded producer introduced, like, he's a record producer who was introduced last book as one of the ciphers, and he was also showed up a little bit as he got Catherine, that is Cecilia's fangirl, to put him in contact with Cecilia. Less wants to sign Cecilia and promise Catherine he'd look at her music too if she helped him. But the plot never resolved that until now. Les is also, again, a cipher. He's one of Dr. Frey's vaguely demonic buddies. He is, after all, a billionaire media mogul. The other's unseen ciphers have been just bothering Dr. Frey more about how bad he is at fumbling these saints, and Les has stopped in to try his own method of ruining them. It just took him a very long time. Again, while these girls are alive and vulnerable, it's crazy the ciphers are all sitting back and watching Frey fumble. He has done absolutely nothing for three books, and while the girls are slinging actual miracles everywhere. It is very easy to interrupt what the girls have done at this point, and they have just left the world's least competent psychiatrist demon to sort through it, and he's done so badly. It's very strange, considering, again, they are aware that these girls are literally, like, blessed by God to disrupt their evil plans, and yet they have left it all in Dr. Frey's hands and just sit on the sidelines, being disappointed. Les plans to corrupt Cecilia by giving her everything she's ever wanted. He figures that with a successful career as a rock musician, she'll forget about all the saint stuff and immediately hooks her up with a luxury apartment and everything she could ever need to record her first album. Which is, as I might note, a really smart way of how you'd corrupt these girls. Wow. Uh, okay. Cecilia's stigmata won't stop bleeding, which is normally a warning of evil, especially in her new apartment, but she thinks nothing of it. As they're leaving the psych ward, Cecilia sees how many fans and devotees have been camping and gathering outside in support of the girls. A violent ri riot suddenly breaks out as vandals hired by Frey make a mess, but it has no effect on anything. Dr. Frey talks to Agnes. He continues to insist she's crazy, and she continues to insist she's not. So Dr. Frey lets her go. Why? Eh. Agnes just says that she'll never change, and Dr. Frey says he'll release her since she's so determined. This could be a setup, in theory, for Dr. Frey to pull a devious plan, but it's not. He also releases Jude and Jesse, because why not? Agnes returns home and back to high school. The girls are, as a reminder, like 17 years old, I'm not totally sure if it said if the other two are. Lucy was a dropout and Cecilia was a runaway, but Agnes is just a high schooler. Her best friend Hazel has been bullied in the meantime for supporting Agnes, and for her vaguely homoerotic undertones. She's bullied in the bathroom by some stereotypical mean girls, but because this is the book it is, the scene goes up to 11 and is one of the best things in the world starting with one of the funniest sentences in the English language. Okay. Oh, God. Okay. The girls move closer together, shoulder to shoulder, blocking Hazel's path. One of them produces a cigarette lighter, the other a joint. You smoke, one asks, taking a deep toke on the fat blunt. Okay, let's stop the scene there. Let's read it again. The girls move closer together, shoulder to shoulder, blocking Hazel's path. One of them produces a cigarette lighter, the other a joint. You smoke? One asks, taking a deep toke on the fat blunt. <laughs> it's just, it's so beautiful. I just, I, I, I kiss my hands. I, I send the beauty into the world for 
deep toke on that fat blunt. <laughs> okay, anyways. You smoke? One asked, taking a deep toke on the fat blunt. Course not, the other said, reaching for the spliff. She's too good for that. Listen, Hazel said calmly. I don't know what's up here, but I got no problems, so I'm just gonna go now. The girls didn't budge. Hazel tried to push through them, but they pushed her back towards the sink. Who texted you? None of your business, Hazel snapped. Was it your virgin bay from the mental ward? Lying ratchet skank, the other laughed, exhaling. Shut up, you fucking trolls, Hazel yelled, ready for the fight that was coming whether she wanted to or not. She better not be coming back here, one of them warned. Yeah, she's making us all look like fucktards. If the tampon fits, Hazel said. Hazel looked both girls in the eyes. Get out of my way, she shouted, rushing them again, hoping that a teacher, janitor, or student leaving detention would hear. She was cracked in the jaw by an elbow and fell backwards. One of the girls grabbed a handful of her hair and slammed her face into the mirror. It shattered on impact, cutting her cheek, the bridge of her nose, and her eyebrow. She wanted to fight back, but dropped to the floor, dazed and still under assault. They kicked her ribs from each side with their hard leather ankle boots. She felt ready to vomit. Her attackers screamed like banshees and lifted her to her feet. Now she looks like a martyr, one of the girls observed heartlessly. Hang on, I want to gram this. She took Hazel by the chin, steadied her, and snapped a few pictures. The bullies let go and Hazel dropped once again to the floor. She was dragged over to the toilet bowl by her hair. Look at yourself and ask yourself. Hazel's head was dunked in the toilet four times, punctuating each word. Is she worth it? Hazel coughed her lungs clear as the attackers laughed at her distress. Drenched, she could smell the ammonia from the janitor's pail and the mildew from the aging pipes fill her bloody nostrils. She cr crawled on her hands and knees, sliding along the moldy and urine-stained tile floor. Yes. Page 60 to 62. It's another stupidly long scene because I had to include it in full. I mean, look at it. High school mean girl pot smokers who wear leather boots and take public Instagram pics of girls they brutalize in the world's most disgusting bathroom. It is meant to be in high school in Brooklyn, though. Actually, this whole series is set in Brooklyn, and it does strike me as I transcribe that scene that the cast is very white for that. The mean girls use ratchet, which is A-A-V-E. I remember that from my high school years, but it doesn't mark these girls as non-white. It was popular slang. But if they were not white, they'd be the first and only not white characters in the series so far, I'm pretty sure. Well, there is Tony, who is a security guard I mentioned from the first book, because he's coming back in this one. And Tony speaks in a heavy accent. I can't fully place. I think it's just a heavy New York accent. So maybe Tony, like at least he's kind of a positive character. <sighs> Jesse wakes up from his coma and cries about Lucy's death, as he just genuinely loved her. Jesse is a very weird character in general. He's both extremely unimportant, yet repeatedly focused on. I have to keep mentioning him, but he hasn't really done anything. He's first introduced as a sort of self-serving slight creep who worked with Lucy to benefit them both. But once the Christian transformation takes place with Lucy, it's revealed he genuinely loved her. He uses his celebrity hot gossip blog to post the picture of Lucy cutting out her eyes and dying. Though he first edits it into like a tasteful montage with only a bit of her bloodstain crawling on the floor without eyes. He then calls up Tony the Bouncer, Lucy's one friend, who offers to help protect Jesse. There's very little plot in the midsection of this book. Like, Cecilia works on her album and shows it to Catherine and Les. Cat Les and Cecilia are flirting, despite everything about that, and Agnes goes to school and is bullied while believers flock and live outside her house. Jesse goes to the public to the uh, Precious Blood Church, and Jude shows up there. Jude is then possessed by Sebastian, who yells at Jesse until he confesses that he believes. The book is very coy about what that belief is, however. Like, as much as God and the big JC are mentioned around, a lot of belief in this context is purely in the girls as saints. It's this cult-like affinity that doesn't fully seem to bleed into Catholicism as much as you'd expect. A lot of the time when they talk about belief and miracles and things, they are only talking about the girls, just not actually Catholicism 
and it almost feels a little bit blasphemous sometimes, I will say. Jesse then is suitably born again after being crucified. Like, his name doesn't escape me. His name is Jesse. But not as a Christian, just sort of as a believer. Agnes, meanwhile, feels sick, and pretty much immediately I clocked it. She's pregnant. Now, this was a plotline I was giddy for. I was just, like, rubbing my little hands together menacingly because it's the perfect end cap to this madness of these books. Agnes going full Virgin Mary. Full virgin birth. She's had some dream sex of Sebastian vaguely, and now she's pregnant. And I'll say it now that this isn't the second coming, because I don't want you to be as disappointed as I was. Instead, it's just a regular old virgin birth after being dream impregnated by the sort of reincarnated soul of Saint Sebastian. Like, you know, standard stuff like that. I've read one other book series that turned unexpectedly super Christian and involved a full second coming, and I was really ready to accept this book was going to go the same way, and I was really disappointed it didn't, because it's so silly when that happens, frankly. Martha overhears Agnes tell Hazel that she thinks she's pregnant, and immediately calls up Dr. Frey, who sees this as like a huge get. It's a pretty standard way to try and ruin Agnes's reputation as an innocent good girl virgin. Though it's worth noting, it isn't illegal to get pregnant, and Agnes at no point has actually defined her brand as, like, the Holy Virgin. Her not having had sex has not been brought up as a key aspect to the worship of her. Premarital sex is a sing, like, in Catholicism, yes, and this would suggest that she's had premarital sex. However, Cecilia and Lucy are very explicitly not virgins, and no one has apparently been disgusted by their sinful histories. Basically, the idea that Agnes being pregnant would convince her followers she's a lying harlot doesn't actually scan in the world of this book where everyone knows the other two girls have dirty histories. I mean, the tagline for this book is pretty much just, these aren't your mother's saints, and that modern edginess is actually key to their following. It's said that the people who now worship these girls as saints, many of them are young people who see them as like, oh, she's just like me, but she's also a saint. So the grit, dirtiness, and the fact that they aren't perfect are part of their appeal. Anyways, Cecilia, Agnes, Tony, and Jesse all meet up for Cecilia's album debut. It's a big show, but she warns cryptically it'll be her only show, having, without incident, realized Les only wishes to corrupt her, and that she still wants to be a saint more than a rock star. This character growth might have been interesting, but like everything else, it just happens without doubt or challenge. She enjoys Les and music life, and then suddenly she moves on. There isn't much of a clear scene where she's realized something is off, where she is like, oh no, this is evil, or she doesn't think about it. She just simply is like, oh, well, I guess he is a demon or whatever, so mm, I'm going to be a saint and I'm probably going to die now. Cecilia then levitates live on stage as Jesse plays the video of Lucy's death and generally just rocks hard. She arranges it so she can crowd surf in the dark at a certain point, while Les is planning to secretly kill and ruin her reputation after tonight. In fact, Les has a switchblade as he's watching the concert from the back, and she body surfs over to him. Less, despite everything about this very public venue and situation, she's in the middle of a rock show, slits her throat when the lights are off. At the same time, having known he was going to do this, she impales him on a sharpened metal cello bow. They kill each other as the lights go up. Tony, a regular man on the sideline, shouts at Jesse and Agnes for letting this happen as they confirm they'd basically guess Cecilia's plan and let it happen, uh, like, anyways. It is pretty crazy, but then Jesse and Agnes are capital B believers and understand Cecilia's murder-suicide was just the saintly thing to do. They don't want to interrupt it. Jesse releases Cecilia's music, since Les never did, where it becomes a top underground hit, while Catherine plays a rockin' show in Memorial, ending with Hosier's Take Me to Church, a song choice with greater context that is funny. In this context, the lyrics are written out and presented in a purely Christian way. I will admit, I remember exactly where I was when I first heard Take Me to Church. Like, I could go on Google Maps and put a pin on exactly where the car was in my hometown one night, and I was definitely also confused why the radio was playing Christian rock freely, so like, I get the confusion. It's kind of a funny choice that the big end cap to Cecilia's death is Take Me to Church, a song that is, um, 
Well, it's not actually Christian, is it? After Cecilia's death, Frey is still trying to ruin Agnes of rumors of her pregnancy, and the police officer, Murphy, continues to run around deeply confused and deeply useless. I cannot really communicate how much these books are actually full of, like, Murphy or Dr. Frey, very boring characters having useless conversations with each other. Murphy, the police chief, is in all three books trying to figure out if these girls are, like, evil or if there's a crime going on or what, and none of it amounts to anything. Cecilia's murder-suicide is confusing, but just accepted by the public, with her friends saying it was self-defense, despite the incredible odds required that Cecilia happened to be carrying a man-piercing cello bow with her at the time, and could mutually stab. <laughs> Cecilia is mourned and entombed in precious blood, but not canonized by the Pope, at least not immediately. Sad, though, like... <laughs> As I even say that, the Pope does show up in this book very briefly at the start. He does yell at some people about the girls. He's there, but he's just not helping much. Jude asks Dorothea, who he's now been living with, if he can return to Dr. Frey and the psych ward. She doesn't understand why since she, he hates it there, but just obliges and leaves him. Again, six-year-old's abused boy neurodivergent, he wants to go back to the psych ward for some unknown reason, sure, I'll be an adult, I'll just drop him off there to go be abused more. Real responsible, Dr. <laughs> Real responsible Dorothea. Anyways, there he just mystifies Dr. Frey, who doesn't understand why he came back and just hates that Jude will not simply talk and explain himself because he's mute. Meanwhile, Jesse and Tony team up to burn down the born-again halfway house. Here's a quote. Born again was up in flames in seconds. Fire spread quickly from the lower floors to the upper ones, and shouts from the residents were heard from inside. Jesse and Tony waited just long enough to make sure the job was done, then ran in separate directions like teenagers on mischief nice, minus the rotten eggs and um, toilet paper. Page 161. I've been speaking for a while. My speaking abilities are failing. There are explicitly people inside this homeless center as our heroes cheerfully molotov it, killing who knows how many. This action achieves nothing and has no effect on anything in the narrative. We circle back to it in the epilogue and that is really it. People mention it, it has no effect. They just commit an act which is extremely hard to sell as morally anything but evil and we all move on. Born Again is said to be the nest of Dr. Frey's evil homeless addict vandal army, but beyond Jesse breaking in and getting crucified, there's actually no proof of this. The characters all hate and distrust the place, suspecting in the last book that Sebastian's heart was there, but it wasn't, and at no point does anyone ever confirm any of the bad guys live in or came from Born Again. As much as Dr. Frey is vaguely an immortal demonic being who killed Jesus, he seems to believe in mental health and rehabilitation quite sincerely. There's a good chance the homeless house our Catholic heroes burned down was legitimately just a halfway house, and the people inside were not evil vandals, but just people who probably burned to death, which is real cool. <laughs> Meanwhile, Martha, Agnes's abusive mother, the book doesn't consider her abusive, she is, is thinking about moving away with Agnes. And this is honestly a very good call considering everything going on, what with Agnes and her friends committing religious suicide to ascend to sainthood. So Martha visits the Precious Blood Church on her own and descends into the Bone Crypt, where both Lucy and Cecilia are displayed in glass coffins. She notices there's room for a third coffin in front of the statue of Saint Sebastian, and she starts breaking down and crying, as she doesn't want to lose Agnes and realizing, like, she's young, she starts almost pleading, I don't want to lose my daughter, she's so young. Realizing, as perhaps you have at this point, Agnes is going to be dead by the end of the book. Martha reads a Bible quote on the wall and then begins to cry for forgiveness, becoming overwhelmed with a feeling of peace and forgiveness. And Martha then is forgiven by the world and the narrative and is able to return to Agnes fully supportive of her future martyrdom. This is perhaps the only clear character developments in this books-ish. It's not really a development. Martha has been a horrible mother from the start. She shows up in the first chapter of the book to neg Agnes for trying to commit suicide. I didn't even want to mention it up front because it seemed like such a deeply bad and probably triggering thing to just discuss right off the bat. 
when Agnes is in the hospital after having just com tried to commit suicide, her mother is there, first chapter of the book, negging her on like, how could you do this to me? You are so stupid and foolish. Like, she is horrible, this woman. And now she's just better. The crux to her change was not loving her daughter, though, and it was not prompted by her daughter. She goes to church and she emerges a better person. It's nice and simple. Whereas there could be some hypothetical good version of a storyline here about Martha struggling with her mentally ill daughter, especially torn by her sainthood, as it will mean her daughter's death. There's just not really anything here. Agnes isn't the one forgiving her, but then Agnes will be dead soon, so who cares? A, a vague serenity in the church forgave her, not for being an abusive parent, but for not believing, like, not believing hard enough in God. And we all just have to accept and move on from that. Oh, but like, as a final act to Martha accepting Agnes, Martha has a vision dream immediately after where she witnesses Agnes and Sebastian get married. So like, Good news, I guess the baby isn't going to be born out of wedlock. I know we were all panicking about that part, okay? Agnes then goes to the hospital to check on her health, and we learn she's actually 28 weeks pregnant. The timeline, though, is very unclear, so I have no idea what this means, like when she actually got ghost pregnant. It doesn't really line up. She also learns, though, that she has a high-risk pregnancy. And while Hazel and the doctor suggest she should think about abortion as an option, Agnes states it's not an option for her. Post the fire, Murphy tracks Jesse down and tells him that he believes Jesse about the supernatural stuff and about Frey being evil, and just gives Jesse a gun, which could be a realistic portrayal of the police in America, honestly. <laughs> he then gets a text that Agnes is going to go into labor and drives to her house to pick her up, promising to meet Martha at the hospital later. Agnes, however, asks to be driven to Precious Blood instead of the hospital in order to give birth. Martha rushes to the hospital where Dr. Frey is. Frey has realized Jude only returned to the psych ward to act as a distraction and is now looking for Agnes. I do want to stop for a second here and just make a note about the ridiculousness of Jude as a distraction. Okay, this is just... So, the premise here is that Jude returned to the hospital on purpose. He was living freed from Dr. Frey, living with Dorothea. He asked to go back to the psych ward so that he could distract Dr. Frey. So that Dr. Frey very explicitly wouldn't know when Agnes was going to go into labor or give birth. It was to keep him away from um, Agnes, who he knew was pregnant. And this is so dumb. Because again, <laughs> Dr. Frey knows Agnes is pregnant. He already knows this. He could have a standing order. This isn't ethical. He shouldn't be allowed to do this. But if he wanted, he could ask somebody in the maternity ward, hey, if this girl comes in giving birth, give me a ping. And he could lie and be like, oh, I'm her psychiatrist. I've been specially requested that if she's going into labor um, for me to be by her side. And again, he shouldn't be allowed to do this, but he could conceivably lie about that. And there's no reason that Jude would have any impact on distracting him. But as it functions, Dr. Frey just sort of doesn't keep up with- he doesn't set anything up. He's just like, I know Agnes is going to give birth, and one of these days I'm just going to, I guess, psychically realize it. But instead, Jude is apparently interrupting that. Anyways, it's dumb. <laughs> I, I spent like an hour discussing this one plot detail of my flatmate. <laughs> so, um... Frey has realized Jude only returned to the psych ward to act as a distraction, and now Frey is looking for Agnes. Martha, who has arrived at the hospital, at the maternity ward as well, reads out the text informing her that Agnes is actually at Precious Blood, cueing Frey in. So Frey and Martha, both at the maternity ward looking for Agnes, Martha gets a text that says, Hey, I'm giving birth at Precious Blood, and she says that out loud in front of the man who she at this point believes and knows is an evil psychiatrist demon. Good job, Martha. Martha then returns and helps Agnes give birth while Jesse and Tony guard the church with weapons. Tony dies fighting off some vandals, while the ones that make it through to where Agnes is, like one makes it through. The final Vagna uh, vandal knocks Martha out and pulls out his phone, which is on a video call with Dr. Frey the entire time. 
He just reaches into his pocket and oop, it's Dr. Frey. Frey taunts him and then orders the man to kill Agnes and her newborn child. Jesse, who is out of bullets, runs at the vandal and is then knocked back. As the bad guys get ready to kill Agnes and her child, her hair again grows very long and envelops the vandal, stopping him and protecting her. Sebastian's heart is in its re uh, reliquary, relinquary, mm, on display nearby, and it just begins to glow and blind him. Then Murphy shows up and shoots him. The police are here and Frey hangs up his video call in a hurry. What Frey was trying to pull here is, as usual, a mystery, like getting somebody to murder Agnes and her newborn baby in a church seems like Martyr 101 and thus the worst possible idea. Agnes is now dying and begins to recite some Latin scripture before naming her daughter Faith and finally passing. She and the girls and Sebastian appear in a vision in the chapel before fading into the light. Um, Martha and Jesse witness this, and I guess in heaven they will go on and continue to be a, a sexless quadruple passionately in love. They sure are all dead, leaving us with no relatable teen viewpoints, only Jesse and a bunch of weird adults. And this is a book for teen girls, which ends with all of the teen girls dead and happier for it. In the wrap-up and epilogue, Jesse claims Faith is his child so he can raise her, with Martha, Catherine, and Hazel all helping. Catherine and Hazel are now friends, bonded by their hyper-specific shared experiences, and just sort of reflect on the girls' legacies in a way that is meant to inform the reader on what they're meant to take away. Apparently, the message of these books is to be good for the sake of it. Look inside yourself for all you need and believe. They practically turn to the audience at this point, and to be fair, they kind of need to. Because when I'm describing all that I've told you so far, have you walked away with it with the knowledge of like, oh, I think I know what these books are about. They're about trusting yourself and to be good for the sake of it. That's what those books are about. Remember when Jesse raised a homeless center? Anyways, here is a conversation between uh, Catherine and Hazel where they just are looking to the audience very directly at this point. You don't need to be Sebastian, or a saint for that matter. Find your own way to express it. I think that's what's important. Being so inspired by somebody, believing in something, in someone so much you die for it. That's a powerful connection to make, though. Kat thought about it for a second, and related it to the only experience she knew well, her own. Whether it's music or spirituality, politics, relationships, whatever, Kat observed, on some level, you have to be willing to give yourself over, suspend disbelief, be a fan, commit to the end, to drink the Kool-Aid. It just depends whether you like how it tastes. Drinking from the wrong cup can get you dead, Hazel said sheepishly. I still don't really understand why it all turned out this way. I miss Agnes. But they're not dead, Hazel. Not really. That guy preaching and those guys listening are proof of it. Faith is proof of it. Living proof. Page 209 to 210. I'll be the one to again point out the obvious, but no, actually, no. <laughs> no. Please don't. This is a bad mindset to have. For sure, I think, that you need to sacrifice yourself to something to have it be worth anything. Like, actually, you shouldn't want to die for something, you should want to live for something. All the characters in the series have had to, tr like, <sighs> all the characters in the series have to treat what the girls do and did as something to admire. When you break it down, it isn't so much as, like, miracles were really happening for out, like, <sighs> It's so hard to talk about this series because it does, it's tricky, isn't it? <laughs> you should want to live and all the characters in this series have to treat what the girls do and did as something to admire. But when you break it down, it isn't as much like the miracles really happening, they didn't matter. They were mostly just some girls who believed they were saints and then to various degrees committed suicide. The epilogue continues with a time skip to the future, where Jesse is shown as the narrator of the events of the story, explaining to a reporter his life story. He is now an immense, like, immensely successful and rich man who adopted both Faith and Jude. His office is across the street from Precious Blood, where the psych ward once was, and where Born Again Stood is now a museum to the girls run by sister Dorothea. 
A portrait of Tony rests in the doorway of the building he helped burn down. Catherine is an amazingly successful musician who donates all of her money, and all the girls' legacies live on, though they're not actually canonized saints. It's like 20 years in the future, but they're not saints yet. And I guess I was wrong about Lucy, but like the Pope in that book, in book two, literally declares her a saint. So I guess he was just going maverick under the official radar. Dr. Frey turned on the ciphers and helped convict a large number of them for unknown crimes, though Jesse warns the ciphers are still out there. And the interview epilogue is a very odd choice. Again, it's 20 years in the future, and it both gives us a vision of everyone having sweeping, ridiculous success, and is also strangely dark, as much of the, like, what the girls apparently saved us from with their noble deaths hasn't done anything. 20 years later, the world is pretty much exactly the same. It's not like everyone is Christian, that paradise is here, that they're all saints. And as ridiculously successful as the heroes are, the status quo appears entirely unmoved. There's still just a cult, albeit one with a museum, and the bad guys are still out there with their vague plan. It ends with Jesse going to pray in church and reflecting on his life as blessed. As if anyone goddamn cares about Jesse, the most boring and useless character in the entire series. It's the conclusion. At the conclusion, I've had some water, so that's pretty important. And, um, well, let's try and just try to talk about this. This book series was a lot, and this review was a lot. It's probably the review I've had with the most sort of side tangents. I am not somebody... I want to discuss books. I don't want to discuss politics. But at a certain point, things that we might dismiss as politics are very important for understanding books on a true level. I can't talk about this book series without doing diversions about why it's bad to say things about mental health like this. I can't properly discuss the series without having to bring Jewish conspiracies into it. So as much as I'm slightly like, oh no, I've made all these tangents, I hope you can understand why it's pretty important that I do these tangents. They're really quite key to understanding what this series is. Because I've read a lot of bad books, and I've read ones which could be argued as worse. I think badness is a very personal experience, and badness can be in different ways. I think it's very hard to say if The Commandment is worse than this, or Light Lark, or Reaper's Creek. Like, they're all different bad books, and that's beautiful. But Precious Blood has been different in a very special way. Part of that is the length it took to get this review done. I've been... I've now moved house, as you can tell by this lovely new background. I'm gonna be excited to put various things that I own on display behind me. But before that, I was in a housing crisis myself. We weren't expecting to be sort of moved off our lease. Our landlord just sort of ended it unexpectedly, and having to find a new place where you, you know, spend more money on an apartment where you have in some ways less things because of the economy, it doesn't put you in a very good mood about things. And that sort of mood impacted my ability to even read these books. I just got upset at times where I was just so weighed down by how hateful these books were. It's, it's, it's tough sometimes. Usually I'm fine. And I don't know, I've dealt with a book just as pointedly direct about its feelings. It's not to say it's better, at least, but most books I've read so far have been very incidental about things like misogyny and racism, barring the specific, the specific ones, where Precious Blood is the point and without any self-awareness, the things it's saying. It's proud of what it is, very specifically proud, and it thinks you reading it should be proud and agree with everything, and I don't really know what to do about that. What I wanted to do, and what I almost still want to do, is contact the publisher and just ask. Like, I can find the editor who worked on this book thanks to acknowledgements, and man, is it tempting. No one do this, I swear to God. But man, does my internal heart of hearts make me want to ask her, what made her accept this book as an editor? Who let this get published at Simon & Schulster under the mainstream YA label? Were we all really blind in 2012 to 2015 about insanely dangerous religious extremism because it was Catholic? Who paid for it? 
but honestly questions like this just won't bring up anything satisfying like don't don't do it it just happened and it's here and oh my god it's a mess what gets me in the end is the message just like the book ends with like not its christianness which isn't necessarily the problem here it's it's that these girls live and die for nothing but the encouragement that you should join them too the main debate around these girls and believing them is never one of doctrine or belief it's just faith in a capital f way like capital b believing to the public the question appears to be purely if you believe they are divine saints or not while believing somebody is a saint reincarnated implies a lot about what you believe, I mean, reincarnation, again, isn't a Christian belief, there's no greater discussion about what the girls stood for. The girls never preach, they barely have an, a message, they have no opinions, they make no statements, beyond the fact that you should believe. To believe in these girls is to be vaguely Catholic and believe in God, but even that isn't explicit. With the girls' deaths, it's hard to understand what we're meant to see the girls as, and what the public sees. I can buy the datification of them and the worship, but it appears to be a fad, not even a true cult. The girls spend most of the books avoiding the public and their followers, and the idea that their following would last after their death doesn't really add up. They achieved nothing. I guess Lucy is a saint now, but at the end of it, what does that mean? <laughs> So while it's nice to think of the author, you know, it's nice of the author to think of a button cap finisher where the survivors explicitly tell us what we're supposed to think, it's important to emphasize how little theme these books actually had. The only tenet of the girls in the end was blind faith, and the only motivator for the plot was blind faith. And I guess in the end, this is a story about dying for blind faith. Please never do that. Because in the epilogue, 20 years later, it sure hasn't done anything for the world. And in the real world, 10 years later, it hasn't done hell at all. These books, like the girls, achieve nothing in the end. But maybe we should all be, like, a bit alarmed that they happened in the first place. Thank you for watching on this sort of lovely journey. Next book series will be <laughs> another interesting one, I'm gonna tell you that. But um, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate your support on these sorts of things. And um, this was a real ride. <laughs> this was such a ride. A real maximum ride. <laughs>